October 10th meeting for the Board of Supervisors. Roll call. Supervisor Bennett? Here. Supervisor Parks? Here. Supervisor Long? Supervisor Foy? Here. And Supervisor Zaragoza? Here. And we have a moment of inspiration. We have Jay Duncan from the City of Oxnard, recycling officer, is going to give us a few words on environmental work in Oxnard and also lead us with the pledge after he finishes. Double duty today, Jay. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chair Zaragoza, Board of Supervisors. It's uh, my pleasure to be here this morning. I'm, I'm the recycling manager for the City of Oxnard. And it is our 21st City Earth Day Festival on Saturday, April 14th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Plaza Park in downtown Oxnard. We have over 56 exhibits, mm. everything from water conservation to environmental vaudeville acts with people on unicycles juggling recyclables, talking about the environment. We have a entertainment that features uh, percussionists that use old paint cans for drums and uh, come up with uh, different rhythms and, and songs for kids, and it's fantastic. The Earth Day Festival has its roots all the way going back to 1992 when then Refuge Superintendent John Zaragoza, uh, under his leadership, started I remember all the trash. <laughs> Earth Day Festival. So yeah. we're very fortunate to keep that tradition going. And we hope to have good weather and a great crowd. There's food, plenty of parking, and a, a lot of good education for resource recovery uh, of all kinds. So, and Jay, I understand that the city of Oxford is what, it, uh, what percentage now of uh, reduction of uh, solid waste? Just over 72%. Is that all, huh? just yeah, 72%? Yeah, we've, we've been very, very fortunate with our programs. And some of the other programs that we have are an excellent MRF, uh, I, or I should say the Del Norte Recycling Station uh, tours for um, uh, children and students where we actually take them up to the viewing deck so they can see actually, actually recyclables sorted and trash trucks come in and, and kids love trash trucks and they love to watch them being tipped and, and all the action that's going on in, in the uh, recycling station. We also have an electronics waste recycling program at the facility. So we get a lot of computers as, as they get uh, smaller and smaller. We get more and more computers turned in from the public. We also have curbside recycling for over 35,000 single family residential homes in Oxnard. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of different waste reduction and education programs going and we're very fortunate for that. And you also have the hazardous waste and also the education to the children uh, at the schools. Uh. Yes, we go out to schools and talk about uh, different uh, composting, worm composting. Kids love to hear about worms mm. and uh, mm -hmm. how they make um, a great soil amendment. Uh, we don't use the word soil amendment to first graders or <laughs> sec second graders, but we, we get the idea across the the excitement over uh, worm composting is, is, is really genuine with the uh, students. So um, it's very exciting to be a part of um, this uh, moment of inspiration. And I thank you for your time. And you used to tell me as a refuge superintendent, Chair Zaragoza, to do things in 25 words or less to help me write in a concise manner and speak in a concise manner. I've probably gone over 25 words. 24 words, you did good. <laughs> Supervisor, can I ask him a question to add to, your, to those words? Go ahead. Hey, you know, you, you've done a tremendous job with that recycling. I've seen all that before. And, mm -hmm. and most of that that comes in and goes on that conveyor belt and you, you pull out, right? Yes. Right. And is that <clears throat> that's only comes from recycling cans itself? Or does that come from all your trash? Um, that, that comes from the recycling trucks. Right, the recycling, recycling trucks. It's interesting. I didn't know if it was true. I've heard that we could recycle a whole lot more if we took all of our trash and broke it into two two places. One is the green, right? Green the green <laughs> waste, which is grass and leaves. And the other was all of our other waste to put and they run through it and then you'd be able to pull all the stuff out that people still throw newspapers in and do all that stuff. But then I've heard there's this issue about some contaminations on recycling. Is that true? Well, we, we do have a, a program at the facility where we ask the operator to pull as many recyclables out of the trash as possible. Right. So if there's a glut of cardboard 
Yeah. Uh, we don't want to see that go to the landfills, landfill. right? And to yeah. Because that's what I've heard. I've heard that we could get to that point. We'd employ a whole lot more people if we could just put it. But there's legislation doesn't allow you to do some of those things that you could even recycle more. That's correct. And add more jobs and all the other things that we could change. Re legislation, we could get more recycling, we could get more jobs, and those facilities could even recycle more. That's correct. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I was wondering if that was still true. Okay, well, great. We do have the commercial uh, cardboard only. Yeah, we have the commercial cardboard yeah. a, a lot for our industrial customers, and uh, also commercial customers from as big as, uh, you know, five employees to, to mm -hmm. 500. I mean... Uh, and just for the public sake, you know, when you say it's 72%, that means for every 100 tons, 72 tons are being recycled, used and reused. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and if you look at it in that perspective, you know what I mean? Right. It also means uh, source reduction or waste prevention practices. Uh, you know, uh, everything from a little thing like uh, businesses using reusable mugs mm -hmm. can be actually uh, counted. Um, you know, uh, grass cycling at some of the bigger businesses, that, that yeah. all can be counted. So that's waste that's not generated in the first place that doesn't have to uh, come into the station. Thank you, Jay. And Jay started working for me when I was 15 years old, 25 years ago. <laughs> thank thank he is looking good, too. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me. Can you help us with a pleasant, Jay? Yes, thank you very much for the time. Put your hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all people. Thank, thank you, Jay. Okay. Next item is your minutes. It's a pleasure to report. Move approval. Okay, got okay, for a first second. You know, I think people worried about machines taking over, so <laughs> they're going the other way now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, that's approved. Uh, item number seven, uh, consent items number, no, excuse me, number six. Um, Michael, do we have any changes? Or? Yes, Chair Zaragoza, we do have a few items. Sound like me today. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in good company. Uh, mm -hmm. On item 36, we've changed the title to read as follows. Approval of the recommended management and confidential clerical and other unrepresented employee resolution changes related to the annual leave redemption program for employees hired after April 5th, 2011 and continuation of other pension related reform discussions previously directed by your board using aspects of the governor's proposed plan as a guide and added CEO recommends approval as proposed. Consent agenda item 12, there's a revised exhibit 2. And consent agenda item 13, there's a revised board letter. Mm -hmm. And finally, time certain item 29, request to be continued to a future date. Okay. Excuse so me, that's uh, sir. Mr. Chair, I, I just missed the very first item that uh, Mr. Powers did. I was had my head buried here. Uh, there's first. just a change in the title to the, uh, the title. Okay. To the item okay. 36. Great, thank you. Item 36, yeah. Any other changes by the board? Yep. Now, what's the pleasure of the board? Move approval of the agenda as revised. Okay. I'd like to um, just make a comment about the consent item 17 when we get there. So, so I don't know if you're you, want, you want to do it now, and then, um, then we can go ahead and vote on the. We're not at the consent item yet, but I just want to let you know when we get okay, to the Okay, when we get to the okay. comment, I don't, I don't need <clears throat> to have it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and. Uh, Okay, now um, agenda item seven, we have a 10 to 23, and, and uh, Supervisor Bennett, item 17. Hold on one second. I, 
I just wanted to compliment staff, and I know we're having increasing conversations about uh, transportation, transportation, mass transit, uh, uh, bicycle uh, paths, alternate uh, to the single occupancy vehicles. And I just wanted to compliment staff for moving forward uh, with some more um, bike trail grants. Uh, some of those will, will uh, uh, be helpful in the Las Posas uh, Valley and also uh, Rice Road. And, uh, I just think that uh, it's one of the one of the few areas where we seem to be able to get some positive funding uh, late in terms of grants. So I just wanted to compliment staff for for pushing forward on bike grants as we're moving. Thank Can you. I ask a question to staff yeah. regarding this item? Go um, ahead. Mr. Fleisch. Um, I know th the Board of Supervisors moved to support a bike trail that would link, a separate bike route that would link Cal State Channel Islands to the park and ride lot in Camarillo, and I'm wondering if that is on our radar for applying for grant funds for. It is a project, ma'am, on the list. Um, again, we have a, a multitude. These were the top two on the list that we had, and so they're the two that we felt right. we could. Uh, I think apply it probably for. requires some um, easement acquisition, and I just, if you could uh, get us a report on the status of that. Uh, to me, that is a, a really valuable bike route because it's connecting a, a major, you know, education facility with a park and ride lot. It will get a lot of use. I'm not. Um, I'm not as um, uh, sure about the one on Rice Road. I don't know what that connects from one to the other. Can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, again, Rice, it's Rice Road that's up in the Ojai area. And oh, it's, okay, it's that yeah, Rice it's not, Road. It's not okay. Rice okay. Avenue, it's Rice Road up okay, in the Ojai that area. So. It. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? What's the pleasure of the board on, on the items? Consent? Tent? Okay. Who's the consent calendar? First and the second. Okay, that's approved. Now we have uh, item number eight, and I have uh, under public comments uh, Lucas Thayer. Lucas? Hi. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. I like human rights. Do you guys like human rights? I like human rights a lot. Sleep is a human right. Everybody sleeps. Some people sleep outside. Some people can't afford to buy a place to stay. Some people can't afford to rent a place to stay. And a lot of people can't afford to rent a hotel room. Sleeping outside needs to be made legal. And public space needs to be made available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for all legal activities, including sleep. Everybody sleeps. Nobody should ever be arrested for sleeping in public. Food is a human right. Growing food is something that should be done by everybody, by the community, to support the community. We have so much land. Right here, even on this, this lot, this building right here, has so much grass and so many plants and so many bushes. And they're already getting attended to by gardeners that are being paid by the county to attend to these gardens. We may as well grow food and pay these gardeners as farmers to grow the food. We can grow strawberries here. We can grow oranges here. We can grow avocados here. We can raise chickens here. We can raise cows here. We have the best land in the country right here in California, and we are wasting it with thousands and millions of blades of grass. And then there are people that are starving right here in the city of Ventura. So that's hypocrisy right there. We're growing all of this, these plants already. We need to grow food for people to eat. Water is a human right. Everyone drinks water. Everyone needs water. Everyone needs clean water. You all have glasses of water right there. There need to be more water fountains made available for all people, wherever they are. Too much water. Too, too much, some people have too much water. Yeah, you know, New Orleans has too much water. Equal access to the legal representation system is a human right. Oh, Steve's leaving. Oh, bye, Steve. Uh, he, oh, yeah, good, good. good. The, uh, the legal representation system right now is tipped unfairly in favor of rich people. Rich people can buy off their lawyers, which are very good at finding loopholes in the laws, making it so that they can commit crimes. It's, it's basically a get-out-of-jail-free card for, for wealthy people, yet poor people be, uh, being charged with all sorts of crimes and not being able to afford legal representation is not adequate, equal justice. Political representation is a human right. And equal political representation is a true, true democracy. Right now, rich people are able to elect officials that create laws which benefit them so that they have tax loopholes. 
with corporate personhood and with money as free speech, and that's unacceptable. Campaign financing needs to be reformed. It needs to be reformed now, before this presidential election. And uh, so we can do it um, starting with the city level, for, starting from the county level. The city of Ojai has already passed a resolution rejecting corporate personhood, stating that corporations are not people and money is not speech. And the cities of Ventura and Thousand Oaks are also being encouraged to do the same. And this county needs to pass a resolution rejecting corporate personhood. Write a letter to Congress from the county of Ventura saying, we, the county of Ventura, have decided that corporations are not people and money is not speech. And you need to make a constitutional amendment saying that right now. Uh, medical care is a human right. People uh, have all sorts of things wrong with them and other people know how to fix them. Doctors should be work working for free for helping humanity. I have a cut on my finger. I probably should have gotten stitches. I couldn't afford to get stitches. My mom has breast cancer and she can barely afford the treatments that she needs to in order, uh, in order to uh, make the, the breast cancer go away. She gets radiation every week. She gets chemotherapy. And these things are expensive. These procedures are very expensive and she can barely afford it. And she's got Medi-Cal coverage, which is inadequate. And so medical care needs to be seen as a human right People need to be trained in the medical profession for free. Education is a human right. If humanity knows how to save a life, humanity owes it to itself to train others in life-saving techniques. And any doctor that ever says to a patient, sorry, I can't heal you because you don't have enough money, is murdering that person. People die because of lack of money for medical care, and that is unacceptable. Every other industrialized country in this world has free medical care for all of its citizens. And the United States of America is paying for free medical care for the people in Israel. But right here in America, I can't afford to get stitches on my finger. So uh, food is a human right, and I think that uh, it, it needs to be labeled. Genetically modified food needs to be labeled. We need to be able to know what we're eating when we're eating it. And so I, I really appreciate you uh, taking into consideration these human rights and putting it on the agenda at the next Board of Supervisors meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and uh, I have nine seconds left. May 1st, General Strike. We've got a question What's here that? from Supervisor. With what you've been talking about over the last few weeks, you mm -hmm. must be, uh, if you vote, you must be voting for the Proposition Paycheck Protection. Proposition Paycheck Protection. I haven't heard of it. Protection because because that, that takes corporate money out of elections, and it also takes union money out of elections. Good. You must be, okay, I just want to make sure that you're, you're, you're true to what your word is, and so you're doing that. And the other thing is I think we have a tremendous medical system here. There's a lot of clinics you could have gone to to get your, your because the people of this county and this country care about people who can't afford things. So I know we have a tremendous medical system. Probably would have given you stitches, and you would have paid a minimal amount to get that done. Well, th thank you. I really yeah, appreciate I that. I want to make sure that you know, we understand. Also, uh, food Thank stamps. The uh, the food stamps are a little bit low right now. I think two hundred dollars a month is not enough for food for uh, for a month. So I think that everyone on the board of supervisors should live for a month on two hundred dollars worth of food, and see how that feels. Or alternately, raise the amount of food stamps that people get. Thank you, Lucas. Rick Smith. Good morning, council members. Good morning. My name is Rick Smith. I'm a resident of Camarillo. Um, my topic today is animal services. Um, back in 2010, I had a couple of incidents with um, a couple that lives in the Woodside Greens housing track. Uh, they apparently filed some uh, statements against me and my dog. Officer Kelly from Animal Regulations came out and investigated uh, the case or the statements that were made against us. Um, a hearing was set for January 26th of 2011, which we went to. We told the truth. My mother and I and my friend Annie Orens, where the incidents had taken place, told the truth. Vicki and Tom Clunan, uh, who also live in the housing track, Woodside Greens in Camarillo, uh, pretty much told lies about the incidents that had happened. Um, Officer Kelly came into our house with the paperwork and said, um, asked us if he could see the dog. We showed him the dog. He's an Irish setter. And, uh, at that time, it was a, a nine-year Irish setter. Um, he looked at the dog. He says, I know that breed. It's not aggressive. In all his notes to, to Director Nolan, there is not one uh, item there that says, I had seen Mr. Smith's dog. Uh, it is an Irish setter, and I know this breed, and it's not aggressive. 
when he left, before he left, he told us, I have seen cases like this before. I really wouldn't worry about it. The most you'll probably get is a slap on the wrist and, and told to keep Rusty leashed. I don't know why he, he made that statement to us, but it was totally uh, unprofessional on his part. Um, at the hearing, uh, we pretty much told the truth. Um, we set it out uh, as far as exactly what happened by incident. Uh, there was four incidents. The first two incidents, uh, the people who made the couple who made the statement against us thought it was pretty serious. Um, the first incident, they claimed that my dog came out of the park. My our setter's curb trained. Um, I made uh, uh, I made those statements at the hearing that my dog's curb trained, and I can prove it. Uh, the second incident and. Oh, on the first incident, the couple also claimed that my dog was aggressively barking. Uh, same on the second incident where the female was walking her dog and claimed that my dog came around a corner and aggressively barked at her, showing teeth, growling, in an attack stance. Well, iris setters don't do that. They're very voiceless. They, they explode themselves with, with barking, and a lot of people can see that as a... Um, as an act of aggression, but it's not. It's just they're very voiceless. Um, I told Director Nolan this. Um, it seems like she just didn't care. I came and talked to Kathy Long, or tried to, and she just totally blew me off, uh, said that she didn't want to have anything to do with it, that I have to deal with Director Nolan. Um, I had three months to do a civil, to file a... Um, in the civil court, an administrative mandamus. Well, when I went to legal self-help, they gave me all the wrong information on how to proceed with this. I went down to the library. The woman in the library really didn't have a clue what it is I should be looking for. Um, I started to write a, a, an administrative mandamus, which was going to cost me $800 to submit to have my case heard. Um, unfortunately, I didn't meet the 90-day the, um, uh, the period. So I decided to go after perjury. I had made, um, I had, at the hearing I submitted 74 uh, signed, um, people who signed my petition uh, in, in favor of Rusty. I even made uh, videos of uh, Rusty demonstrating that he is curb trained, um, that he is very friendly with children, he's uh, a non-chaser, he does chase motorcycles, and that's why I, I trained him. Um, hot rods, anything with loud noises, helicopters, airplanes. He's very funny. He just, he, he, that's his way of entertaining himself. Um, but he is a non-aggressive uh, animal. He is, you know, for an Irish setter, their temperament is non-aggressive. I submitted all this information with Director Nolan. And it, I, I'm getting this, this, um, in, input from her that she doesn't care. She didn't base her decision on lies. She based her decision on the Clunans fearing my dog. Well, if the Clunans lied about my dog and I've given or submitted all the proof to Director Nolan, why doesn't she take this into consideration that the animal is not an aggressive animal, that the Clunans did lie about it, and that she should have based her decision on that? Mr. Instead, Smith. she based the, her decision I, I know that the staff is taking notes of that, that your time's up. Okay. Thank you so much, and, and I'm sure the staff is... Go ahead. You want to nice. What was the decision? That he, he's a nuisance. He's got to be tagged for the rest of his life, and I've got to pay $100 a, a year for this tag. Oh, okay. And they get off scot-free. Mm -hmm. I've got proof that he is curb trained. I've got proof that they lied. In fact, in the transcript of the hearing... it. Officer Kelly made a statement about seeing, about investigating and, and interviewing my neighbors. One of my neighbors said that he is curb trained. He chases motorcycles. And Tom Clunan asked Officer Kelly if he, when he chases motorcycles, does he leave the curb? Officer Kelly says he's on the sidewalk and down. Tom Clunan says, how far down? His wife, uh, Vicki Clunan, butts in and says, to Pleasant Valley Road. Um, Rick, you know, uh, the CEO is saying staff will get together with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Michael Schofield? Michael? Mm -hmm. Good morning. 
Good morning. I'm Michael Schofield. <clears throat> I came to talk about housing. I have a small mountain cabin that I rent in the last few years. I've had it for about 30 years. I've lived there off and on, and the last few years I've rented it for a little extra money. And um, I have a neighbor. He's uh, He slums the... He rents the house below me. He also, uh, he's at 8116 North Ventura Avenue. He also rents another house in that same area at 8663 North Ventura Avenue. And um, they grow marijuana there. I've uh, always had pretty good luck in renting the house in the past, and I've had it up for rent for 10 months, and no one seems to want to rent next to that, which I don't blame them. Um, I kind of came here to ask you for your help and see if you had any suggestions for me or um, you had anything that you might be able to uh, do to help me out on this situation. Supervisor. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So you're talking about is your cabin on the North Avenue area? It's in uh, it's uh, on the street above Venter Avenue. That's okay. um, you know it's a hillside property, so I'm kind of up here and they're down right. here. You look right in on that. Uh, if, operation, if, uh, you know, it's right at the entrance of the Ojai Valley, and I would think, you know, it's a pretty prestigious area. Um, I was kind of hoping that that street, had, you know, it's one of the nicer spots. I take really good care of the property. I've done a lot of improvements over the years. And Thank you. Uh, if I could just ask, would you mind just going up to the fourth floor of my office and meeting with my staff, and they'll get your information, and we'll look into this and see what we can do to... Sure, just that'd be fine. So it's the fourth floor, if you just ride right up. And um, my staff is listening to this right now, so uh, they'll be looking for you. Okay, okay. that'd be great. Thank right. you. So it's Steve Bennett's office. and just followed There was one other thing I wanted to mention. When the last guy I rented to, I don't know who keeps track of this, but it was uh, Michael Edward Allen, and he took out a permit for 99 plants on my address without my permission. And um, I wanted to make sure that that was, you know, uh, it was known to the board here that I didn't want that. I don't know exactly how to cancel it or whatever, but I don't want that, uh, affect, you know, attached to my address. And your name again is, sir? Michael Schofield. Michael Schofield. All right, great. And the fourth floor. The supervisor. Yeah, is there a room? Or? Looking for it. It's Steve Bennett's office. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Thank yeah, you very much. Steve I appreciate Thanks, it. your time. Thank Have you, Have a good Mike. day. Thank you. Okay, and our next item is board comment, uh, Supervisor. Thank you. I'd like to uh, adjourn the memory of the people on this list. Also, I'd like to recognize two local educators inducted into the Education Hall of Fame here in uh, County. Larry Jones, who coached Moore Park High School academic uh, decathlon team, led four national championships. <clears throat> and so uh, we can see why he's, he's there. And also uh, Keith Baker, <clears throat> Barker, who taught 34 years at Royal. I just want to thank them for their service and, and what they do for the kids. The, the right teachers make a huge difference in people's lives. So I wanted to thank them for that. Also, I wanted to put up a PowerPoint if they have it ready. Do they? A PowerPoint. A PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you have one today? There it is. This is the I called the Exodus. I don't know if you all saw this, but it's interest data according to the IRS. It talks about California has lost $27 billion in tax revenue over the last past decade, $27 billion. And you wonder where our taxes are gone. <clears throat> Other high-taxed uh, and overregulated states include New York, Illinois, and New Jersey. All have lost tax revenue. But it's interesting, when you see this exodus, where are people going? They've gone to Florida, which gained $70 billion, Arizona, which gained 18, Texas, which gained 16. And these are lower tax lower regulated and you know it's interesting because not this last Saturday but the Saturday before the United States became a distinguished position in the world the highest tax corporate tax in the world and it's interesting how you see people locally will move in a country to find better opportunities lower taxes and yeah, I think we've seen that uh, worldwide too where people move out of countries Japan just lowered their tax that's why we became the highest tax and by doing that, we also understand as Japan has had this higher tax, we've lost, we had the lost decade of Japan, we had all these kind of things that went on. But let me, uh, as two million people packed up for greener pastures, it's interesting that we talk about one of our great companies in California, Apple. Apple announced it was building a $304 million campus in Austin with plans to hire 3,600 people. Why wouldn't they do it here? 
the regulation. It's too expensive. <clears throat> we also heard that with our own uh, house automation, some of the issues. California forked over 10.6% of its income to state and local governments. U.S. average is only 9.8%. Uh, even Texas is 7.9%. But it also is some other things. The state regulation costs almost $500 billion a year in California, five times our budget. Those are some of the issues that we deal with here. And regulation costs $134,000 million, $134, for every small business. Why I bring this up is because of jobs. The opportunity to create jobs for us to drive revenue, we have to have an environment that's friendly to business or people. You know, business is just an opportunity for some someplace to work so somebody can work, they can enjoy the California dream. And it, it's, you know, one of the other things we have to deal with, we have to deal with our welfare issue. One third of all Americans on welfare reside in California, even though we only have 12% of the population. Those are issues that are important. And then listen to this. California's, in, I mean, Colorado's individual income tax is 4.63%. Peyton Manning was looking at going to San Francisco to play, wasn't he? But he ended up in Colorado, play for uh, Denver Broncos. On his contract, it saved him $4,483,000 over a five-year period of time because of the difference in the tax here in California. That's, that's just crazy. There's no way we're going to attract these high-income people like Tiger Wood who left and all the rest who leave if we have this kind of tax base. We've got to figure out how to pull together and bring our California government into line or we're going to continue to lose these kind of people who pay taxes, who allow us to have the California lifestyle that we're all used to. It's all going to go away if we can't continue to do the right things and find ways. So everything, that, every decision we make at this board has an effect because it affects the county, affects people in the county. I think you've seen the articles that, Cal that they expect this county to grow very slowly because of some of our issues. So we've got to deal with that. Those are my comments for today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Parks. <laughs> Short and sweet, as, mm. the, as the man said. Thank you, <laughs> Supervisor Foy. Uh, I've uh, been talking with a lot of our uh, county's CEOs and leadership and seeing how much the tax rates depend on what decisions they make. They, they base their decisions on growth, on what kind of tax rates, and uh, it's a, a different way of looking at things. I have a, a couple of things I'd like to bring up. Uh, one is that we now have open registration for the Senior Summit, and uh, I appreciate uh, the supervisors' offices are all doing some good recruiting and, and getting the message out there, and we look forward to filling all 350 slots that are open. And uh, the brochures are out, but just uh, simply if you go online to ventura.org slash Senior Summit, you can uh, sign up for, uh, we have 10 different workshops in the morning and, uh, and another five in the uh, afternoon and lunch and transportation provided. So looking forward to dealing with the issues of the integration of physical and mental health at this particular senior summit. And again, thank you to the supervisors for their work on this and also to the healthcare agency that is um, doing, being the uh, lead on this. And hopefully we'll be able to do that in the future too. Uh, also, we had the first meeting of the SOMAS MAC and had about 70 people there, and including our county council and uh, our, our professional uh, from the fire department and the sheriff's department attended, uh, Dave Fleisch and, and uh, Mr. Pratt with the public works department was there too. So uh, it was uh, very well attended, a lot of good information was received, and the residents were so incredibly appreciative for the opportunity. So I'm, I'm glad that we did form that MAC, and they have some big work ahead of them already. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, kind of a delight, we have been uh, very concerned about methyl iodide in Ventura County. And it was a, a huge concern as a replacement for methyl bromide, which isn't a particularly good um, um, weed killer either in terms of the impacts to public health. But methyl iodide is a very serious um, uh, constituent that provides, uh, well, actually leads to cancer and um, uh, lung disease. And so it was nice to see that the manufacturer decided to pull that and, and not push forward on that. It is 
you know, uh, a fumigant for, for strawberry crops, but it is uh, just one of the more lethal uh, fumigants out there. So now it's nice to know it's not out there, and uh, hooray for that. I know our agricultural commissioner has worked diligently on this issue too. I also was attend, uh, able to attend a CLU economic forecast and uh, hearing a, a good information about our economy and then also attended the uh, going away party for Woody Smeck and it was, he was very honored to receive a resolution from the Board of Supervisors. Uh, able to also attend um, the welcome home for State Assemblyman uh, Jeff Gorell and uh, coming back from Afghanistan, getting back to work in the Assembly and uh, a real patriot for our country and it was nice to see him and uh, a, de a well-deserved welcome. And then finally just want to leave with the uh, talking about um, the concerns, and maybe Mr. Powers was going to mention this, but seeing an article uh, regarding the city of Los Angeles and what's happening with their budget, 222 million deficit that they have right now, and that is going to double in the next year or two. And just uh, realizing what happens when you are in those kind of situations and the lack of services that um, comes from that. So. Fortunately, here in Ventura County, we have been good fiscal stewards and been able to establish a reserve fund that is helping us now in these harder times and also being strong in uh, a lot of uh, requests from the unions back in the day that um, have actually hurt a lot of the cities and, and counties in the state of California. So uh, we'll be looking to see uh, how the city handles it in, in Los Angeles and um, wish them the best. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Bennett. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'll start off. I appreciate um, Supervisor Foy's uh, slide about the corporate tax rate, and um, uh, and and I agree that, that we we do have that the highest tax rate. Um, we need to lower the tax rate, and we also need to level it out by having the tax loopholes are what's killing us. So that although we have the highest tax rate. When the effective tax paid by corporations is much lower because they have so many different loopholes, and that, that's the reform that I think I'm really seeing bipartisan support starting to rally I, I around. Think, I think there is that in there is, exactly what you're saying, because yeah. a lot of small businesses don't get those loopholes, so exactly. it kills them, the ones that create 80% yeah. of the jobs, you're right. And so we've, well, yeah, we've got to, I think, I think there's, there's whole, whole, there, there is bipartisan support for that, so I, I appreciate you bringing it up, and it is uh, something we have to do. Uh, on the positive side, uh, reported this morning that the teen birth rate is uh, the lowest that it's been since they've been uh, keeping records. Mm -hmm. And um, with our role here in county government and uh, dealing with social services and stuff, that's good news uh, for us in, in terms of the effectiveness of, mm -hmm. of all of the efforts to try to decrease that uh, teen pregnancy rate. Um, along that line, I want to talk about one, uh, not along that line at all, but I, I want to talk uh, um, uh, about a number of um, the things that I was able to, uh, uh, to attend, but some very effective Effective ones. Los Padres Forest Watch had their fifth annual uh, Ojai Wild event uh, uh, March 31st. Um, it was a, a great event. And the Boys and Girls Club had their annual Power of One breakfast. And um, that's something that this board has taken a real interest in in terms of the Boys and Girls Club and our role. And um, they had a very effective fundraiser that morning. And then I know we've um, really tried to adopt the model that the foster children are, we're the extended family for the foster children. I just want to report on one of our foster children, Christine Miranda, who's been here in front of us. Um, she um, uh, just got accepted to uh, intern for Congresswoman um, Karen Bass in Washington this um, summer. And uh, she, she wrote, she says, I'm thrilled, and I just wanted to share this moment ex of excitement with you. So I wanted to pass that on to everybody on the board uh, to see one of our foster children that's worked through the whole system, uh, stood in front of us, was the head of, uh, of the, uh, the uh, California Youth Organization of Foster Children here in Ventura County, and now uh, going, to, going to law school and uh, interning for Congresswoman Bass. And you know she's going to do something for foster children uh, as, as she uh, moves into her adult uh, career and stuff. Um, so um, I want to pass those on to you. Uh, and uh, also had a chance to stop at the, uh, the one-stop, uh, the um, 
for our, uh, our, our homeless uh, uh, services and see the good work that's being done, uh, done there by uh, those people. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we had a busy week. I had uh, my staff really working uh, a lot this week. Uh, Stan Hakes um, attended the most inspirational student award over in El Rio, uh, real school district for 4.0 students. Lourdes also, um, one of my uh, assistants, attended this Optimus event over in Oxnard for the uh, submitted awards and accommodations for, for our women in Oxnard that are doing good work. And Bill attended the Oxnard Fire Department retirement dinner for quite a few fire uh, department of uh, firefighters that retired. And also Bill and I attended the Cesar Chavez March in Oxnard. You know, we have several hundred people that attended that. And also I, I read in the paper, and I want to commend all these employees that from the county then won a quarter of a million dollars. That's, that's really, I, was it VCMC employees, uh, Michael? Uh, Human Services Agency. Human Services Agency. So maybe they can share some of that wealth with us. <laughs> Help us with a budget. Huh? And also I want to uh, adjourn in, in memory of this folks, and especially for Ray Porky Duran, who was a community activist for Oxnard that helped uh, the, the, our youth and, and the community in Oxnard, and I think he was the county employee too. And also on behalf of uh, my uh, brother-in-law that passed away too, uh, Dickie, uh, uh, Actually, Frank Dickey Bagnale said that we attended uh, his uh, services yesterday. So that's it. Thank you. And we go to our next item. Um, what is it? Uh, 34? No. 35. Mm -hmm. Item 35. Who's up for that? Who's, uh, is that Pratt or? You should continue, so 36 then? Is he here? Wait a minute. <laughs> Can I go ahead and move approval of 35? Okay. Um, this is definitely a positive uh, grant I, that we will be getting to help with breathing apparatus for the fire protection. And, and, and I agree with that. I'll, I'll, sure. I'll second. Or Bennett, you second? Okay. Okay. Three votes will do it, will it not? Yep. All right. Okay, and that's approved. Item 36. That's uh, Mike Powers. Mm -hmm. For uh, Supervisor Foy. We're going to wait a couple of minutes for Supervisor Foy. Okay, we're ready for, uh, are we ready for 36? Please stop. Please stop. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Well, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, good strategy. Well, thank you, Chairs. That it goes to board members and members of the public and county family. Uh, appreciate the time today and 
uh, with my voice, there's a good news. One, the pr presentation will be shorter, and you'll hear more of Matt Carroll. Than 25 me, so. words or less. 25 right? words, yeah, if I get those. So uh, this is our report back to your board on the annual leave redemption uh, and pension report. And this is just to give you a sense of, sort of what we're going to cover here uh, pretty quickly. There's a lot of information, but we're going to move pretty quickly through it. I uh, want to give a sense of our, so our summary of our recommendations, but also the fiscal condition of the county and of our pension system. The factors that we considered in developing the recommendation, uh, as well as the history of the program, and uh, again, sort of how we compare to other counties and cities and uh, comparable jurisdictions that we compete with for, for staff. Uh, so with that, and the other thing that is important to us is that, as you can see up there, that this be data-driven. Uh, this is a very complex area. And one of the things we wanted to do was take the time to, to really do the research, understand where we are, where other jurisdictions are, uh, so that we make uh, good decisions and make good recommendations. Because it's a very complicated area, and we didn't want to make any, recommend any changes until we understood where we, where we stood. So just a quick reference uh, back on April 5th, 2011, your board directed our office uh, to suspend the annual leave redemption program for newly hired management employees as of that date, uh, and recommended that we bring back a replacement program uh, that meets the following requirements. Uh, it's legal, it's fair to the employees, uh, and makes total compensation uh, transparent, and also sort of balances uh, the fiscal sustainability uh, with the need to retain and be competitive and retain our high quality and continue to recruit our high quality workforce here at the county. And then you directed that we continue sort of broader pension discussions uh, in addition to that. So here's a quick summary of uh, aware of, of the recommendations. Uh, as you can see, uh, the gist of it is uh, really four main points. One is to reduce the hours from 160 to, to 100, uh, and then for uh, battalion chiefs from 244 to 140, uh, to eliminate the gross-up provisions, and that's the amount where uh, when you sell back or you redeem your annual leave, you get additional uh, funds uh, related to that for the value of your benefits. Uh, and what this will do will actually uh, bring uh, all of the, uh, well, bring the managers a benefit more in line with the other uh, employees at the county, because for most of the unions, they don't have that. Uh, we'll also limit the frequency of the redemptions to once per 12 months. And by virtue of the fact that this uh, program will be subject to change or elimination by the board uh, for these employees hired after April 5th, it will not be vested. And then again, your board directed that we, uh, should we uh, approve this going forward, that we work with our uh, union partners and other stakeholders uh, to look at uh, other uh, pension reform related issues, and particularly those aspects of those that are uh, set forth in the governor's proposed uh, initiative. Uh, here we just wanted to give a, just a, a sense of the, of the fiscal impact of this. You know, in, in the first year or so, we estimate anywhere from 450 to, to 600,000. Uh, so certainly significant. Uh, you see in the out years, going 15 to 20, uh, it becomes more significant, of course, and that's up to uh, $9 million when fully implemented. And part of that is because this is for you know, perspective, you know, for, for newer employees. And it, it's a long horizon, but you know, what we want to do is, is plan for the future here. And so it's appropriate that we look at what the decisions that we're making today, the impact they're going to have down the road. And you can see the relative percentage uh, impact of the proposed recommendations, uh, the hours reduction at 2.8% and the gross up elimination at 3% being the two, uh, two uh, changes that have the most impact. We just want to clarify, particularly at the top one, and we've had a few questions about this, uh, that these recommendations, the proposed recommendations, apply only to those employees hired after April 5th, 2011, whether or not they are covered by the management MOU when they're hired. So if they're employed before April 5th, 2011, but they're not in management, but they later promote into, they'll get uh, the previous management benefits. Uh, and so here's some key factors that we looked at and sort of setting the, the table for our, uh, our recommendations. One is sort of the overall fiscal health of the county, of our pension system, and again, I, I touched on this, uh, our comparison with our peer jurisdictions. So the fiscal health of the county, uh, and this is something I think it's, it's very important that we have this discussion in this context. Uh, as uh, the supervisor Parks alluded to, it's 
tough out there for everyone in our community and up and down the state. The counties are feeling it. Cities are feeling it. Uh, and what you're seeing is many counties out there uh, who are having to cut services in the face of increasing demand for services as the economy's been down. At the same time, they're having reduced federal and state funding. So it's creating a huge challenge, sort of a perfect storm of events. And we're seeing uh, in many counties uh, significant uh, impacts. In San Francisco, $380 million deficit. Santa Clara, $220 million, 500 positions eliminated with 100 layoffs. I won't go down the whole list, uh, but it's significant. Uh, you heard the supervisor speak this morning about the city of Los Angeles. I just received an article on the Newswire a couple of days ago uh, about Riverside County, which ha also has now an $80 million deficit, and they're facing 200 layoffs. I was, I was going to bring that up. You know, yeah. it's very significant. Yeah. It really is. And, and what you're seeing is twofold. One is they're cutting critical services when the community mm -hmm. needs it most, and they're having layoffs, which is, which is terrible. So that's to give you a sense where, where our county uh, fits during these difficult times. And we've also been able to have a structurally balanced budget. And that's very, very significant, of course, as, we've just, as we just talked about. And that's due to the fiscal discipline of your board, our county management team, and our workforce. Different, I'll just touch on a couple of big things. One, ongoing savings in terms of our uh, Lean Six performance improvement programs. There's $9 million a year in ongoing savings every year. And it's still just getting started. We're just getting warmed up. Uh, Overhead and ISF cost reductions, very significant over the last two years. Great work by our general services agency and IT departments. Four million last year, four million next year. So eight million dollars in ongoing savings and overhead. That translates into sustaining services and protecting jobs. And we're not just saying this just to sort of pat ourselves on the back. These are real actions that have taken place showing real results here in our county. Reserves. Also, as you're seeing, a lot of counties are actually having to dip into the reserve to try to sustain services as best we can. Well, in our county, we've actually managed to increase uh, the reserve. Not only not dip into it, but increase it. So now we're up over around 10% in reserves. We want to go higher. We want to be at 15, but relative to most counties, that's very, very positive. And then finally, uh, just I think the fact that we have the highest possible bond ratings on the bond rating agencies is very significant. Bond rating agencies don't care about nice services, this or that. They just care about your fiscal track record and your future prospects. And when they've looked at our county, this is what they've done, which is a real validation. And, and Michael, I think that the, the public should know about the standard and course rating that we, yep. that we had and that we went over to New York to. That's right. You might want to share, you know, the, the positive uh, input that we got from those uh, raters. You know. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Yes, and that's, that's exactly it. They looked at our numbers. They looked at our track record mm -hmm. and how we've been doing. and. and gave us the highest rating, which coming from California and being a county, you would imagine they had a few suspicions or doubts about uh, our right. fiscal situation. Uh, but in spite of that, they still gave us the highest rating. The highest rating, which is important. That saves us billions of dollars. It? it does. Mm -hmm. uh, quick summary of the uh, pension mitigation history. So we're talking today about some changes. But really, pension reform here at Ventura County has been going on for many, many years. Uh, if you look back in 1979, the board decided, elected to close Tier 1 retirement system, which had a little bit more generous formula and a cost of living adjustment attached to it for non-safety uh, employees. And they, they implemented a Tier 2 system. Well, that system has one of the lowest, and, and that just so you know, that covers about 80% of the county workforce. And 95% of the employees covered on the management MOU we're talking about here today. So tier two, this, this is the system we're talking about, has one of the lowest benefit formulas and no cost of living adjustment. I think it's the only 37 act county without a cost of living adjustment. And it has three year averaging. Instead of your last highest year of compensation determining your comp earnable, it's a three year averaging, which is actually what the governor is proposing. In 2001, uh, your board eliminated the vac vacation buybacks for future elected officials. In 2004, uh, Again, the board acted to reduce annual leave accruals and sellback limits from 200 to 160 hours. And then from, I want to say, a few years after that, there were many efforts, understandable, to, to increase uh, safety retirement to, to a formula of 3% at 50 or 2.5% at 55, which would have been you know, more generous benefits but significantly higher costs, and your board uh, declined to do that. In 2010, very significantly, your board acted, and the managers led with this, 
and they agreed to contribute 3% of their salary towards uh, the retirement, their retirement pension pickup. And that was very significant. Then what followed was all of our labor unions, the ones who had open contracts, all agreed to the same reduction. Safety unions, our professional firefighters association, our deputy sheriffs association, they had existing contracts. They voluntarily reopened those contracts to agree to reductions and increase their contributions to those pensions. Just extraordinary. So the county has really been a leader in the state, actually, in working towards pension reform. And also as part of that, and we'll touch on this later, uh, they increased uh, the contribution for future employees so that they pick up more of their own, uh, their own share of their pension costs to the point now where, where most county employees actually pick up their full, uh, their full half share. And in 2011, uh, and that's the action we're talking about today, your board suspended the annual leave redemption program uh, and asked us to come back with a uh, recommendation. Just a quick summary on where our system sits, the pension system. So we talked about the county's fiscal health. We'll touch on the pension's fiscal health. Uh, as you can see, the county has the fourth lowest pension contribution rate among the other 20 37 Act counties. Uh, and that's where about 22.4% uh, compensation, it's, that's the percentage of total compensation that the retirement cost makes up. We also wanted to see what level of funding we had. Yes, sir. Can I just ask one? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, they do, and we're going to touch on that, I, I believe. Thank you. Uh, we'll see if they're on the list. I didn't say that. In the, yes, the have, is yeah, right there. Pension obligation. Just bonds. the way we practiced it, right? Okay, okay. good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, exactly. And so we looked at this at first. All of this was in blue. We said, well, where do we rank among other counties? Well, we're right in the middle, about 80%. So, hmm, okay, well, that's not bad, but it's, it's not great. But then we said, well, how many of these other counties actually finance their unfunded liability? issued what's called pension obligation bonds. Those are in red. So of those counties that don't have pension obligation bonds, Ventura County of the 37 Act is one of the most well-funded. So could we go back a slide again? Yes. All I right. see Imperial, so, Los Angeles, and, and Tulare. Tulare. So the three, the, the three to the right here. There you go. They're, 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 they're well-funded, they're, they're well but they have pension obligation bonds. But if we could go back one, the... I think this is a significant one, though. This is percentage of payroll right. going to pension obligation, um, and um, they are, uh, you know, they've got the pension mm -hmm. obligation. Thank you. Okay. And just to give you a sense of how much we're talking about, in uh, Sonoma, which is not a huge county, that's about $250 million. Contra Costa, over half a billion dollars in pension obligation bonds. San Diego, $840 million, and so forth. Very significant. We, we had a pension obligation bonds that paid them all off about two years ago, is that right? Yeah, yeah, a couple of years ago, that's right. Yep. Uh, and you see now our uh, retirement contribution rates have been going up, but in the next couple of years they're going to start falling. A part of that is because uh, the fiscal discipline of your board and the county family coming together to manage the workforce and, and uh, keep our compensation at a stable level. Uh, I think this one is significant. What this is, is <clears throat> for about the last five years, it shows what the actuaries on the left-hand side, and I think that's blue, uh, <clears throat> what the actuaries have told the county, you need to contribute this much to keep your system in good shape. And sometimes it's, you know, almost every time it's significant dollars, starting at around $75 million up to $110 million plus. And every time the county has paid that exact amount. And the actuaries, again, they're looking at data, they're looking at numbers, they're looking to see what is the fiscal health of the pension system. And you can see the county's meeting its obligations. Uh, this is just to give you a sense now, we're going to start where, uh, what's sort of the average, what's the, what's the profile of, of pensions in our county? Uh, there's been a lot of attention paid to some of the outliers, and you see them uh, on the far right there, the over uh, 200,000 annual. And there's about 22 to 24 of those folks. But the vast majority, you see over 55, you know, almost 55% have a uh, retirement amount under 25,000. About 87% under 75,000. So that's, and most of those, now nearly all, well, I want to say about 80% of those don't have any cost of living adjustment associated with that. So we wanted to sort of give you a true profile, again, looking at the data to see where we stand, where most county employees are. Uh, so we have a true picture as we develop our recommendations. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Carroll to uh, 
carry on. All right, thanks, Mike. As, as Mike said, we're now transitioning from the health of the system to what individual employees look like. And this chart uh, indicates uh, where the average pension by our pension program, by our, our tier or the particular pension program we're in. You can see on the far left, uh, the average employee has 18 years of service and about $35,000 in pensions. Next is safety, 24 years, 80. And we'll talk a little bit more about safety as we get there. Uh, tier 1, 21 years, and $39,000 is our average pension. And the, and the Tier 2, which again is the, average, is the bulk of the people we're talking about today uh, with the management resolution, Matt, 13 how, how many, years. How many people would that be, roughly? Um, the manage, in, in Tier 2? Uh-huh. Uh, 6,300 approximately, maybe a little higher. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 6,300 in Tier 2 of our active employees right now okay. are in Tier 2. Mm -hmm. Right? So one of the things... Sure. We talked about, and, and Mike wanted to stress, was, okay, this looks all fine and good, but we know there's a lot of history based in here, a lot of 20-year retirees. Let's mm -hmm. look at what uh, the amounts look like when we go to retirees for just the fa last five years. And as you can imagine, it increases a bit. Uh, we go from 18 and 35 for the uh, average employee up to 19 years and 42,000. There's an increase in, in each of them, probably around that same ratio. I think Tier 1 is actually a little bit higher increase than the rest of the ratio. But when we come down to tier, three, tier 2, which again is the bulk of our employees, 6,300 active employees are in that tier, we're still at a modest 15 years and $23,000 average pension for those Tier 3 employees. So we took this one step further. We said, what if we took the average manager or the average employee covered by today's management resolution, and that includes confidential clerical and unrepresented employees, we said, let's take that average employee, apply the statistics from the last uh, uh, five years of retirees, which is if, we, if that employee at their average salary retired at 61 years of age and 15 years of service, you see the pension amount we're talking about is $33,700. So that is today the average pension out of your active Tier 2 employees in the management resolution is going to be $33,700, give or take. Again, a relatively modest figure. All right, that, that takes the look at the individual employees and the averages, and we didn't want to spend any more time on that, but we did want to go into some of the other components of retirement because as we look at, as your board acknowledged, uh, the, uh, the Lee Redemption Program has a material impact on, on pensions, and so Mike wanted to make sure we looked at all other aspects of pensions to, to understood, understand all the moving pieces and the connections here. So I'm going to summarize what we found and then go into a little bit more detail. And basically, uh, the, the things that stand out the most is, and we'll see this, uh, uh, Ventura County, when compared to our peers, is, is low on the retirement formula. We're the lowest safety formula and second lowest in the 37 Act of, uh, of the, uh, the uh, non-safety employees. We're low on cost of living adjustments. As Mike said, that's a huge factor. Uh, that, in, that doubles an employee's pension in less than 20 years, typically, if they get 3% a year. So uh, the fact that we're low on uh, cost of living, we don't have a cost of living increase for our uh, Tier 2 employees, and we're one of only 15, we're the only one of, you'll see the benchmark counties that we come up with in cities that doesn't have a Matt, cost of living. Steve, in terms of 37 Act counties... How, do, you, do you have the statistics on how many of them have no colas versus colas? There, we were the original one, and there was a recent implementation. I think it was at Solano or Sonoma, one of the S counties up north, came in with another tier, still a higher formula, but no cola. So all the other 37 Act counties have colas? All but well, now one additional the, county, I think, within the last year. That's year. 20 counties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Right. Yes, correct. So the, of, of, the, of the 20 counties, there are only two that don't have colds, right? Yes. Us and one of them. And you, right. you mentioned something about uh, that doubles the pension after uh, at about three percent a year. I think it's right around twenty years that, it, that your pension will double. If you had a cola, and if you don't have a cola, it about cuts your pension by half. Then in that same, you're going to you're going to see what that does. Yes. We'll, we'll close out with some examples there. Okay, uh, the third factor was, as we are all acknowledging, our, our, well, as we'll show, that we're a bit high on compensable earnings. In other words, the total calculations that go into your pension, uh, the total compensations, because of three factors, we come out a little high on that. That doesn't necessarily mean the pensions are higher, and we'll show you what that means, mm -hmm. or show you that. Uh, we're low on retiree medical. We have none. 
Mike, did you want to? Hey, just to touch on this, you see about half of our peer jurisdictions do have it. And this is very significant because as I've learned from these jurisdictions, in some cases, their unfunded liability for their retiree health is bigger than their unfunded pension mm. problems. So it's very significant that that's a problem that we don't have. That we don't have that. Yeah. Yes. So that's retiree medical. The other two components we looked at were social security participation and whether there's a match on deferred comp. And where that comes in is we're average. Eight of 16 of our peers have social security participation in addition to their defined benefit plan. And eight of our 16 peers that we looked at have a deferred comp match. So we're right in the middle there. So we'll spend a few minutes going over some of these details. First of all, the formulas. As we said, the county's active retirement plan for non-safety tier two, which covers 80% of our employees and 95% of the people covered by this resolution we're looking at, is the second lowest of all Pier 37 Act counties. It's the lowest of all the jurisdictions in Ventura County. And as you'll see in our, uh, and, and again, it's the only one without a COLA, our original, and, and we think we have one more at this point, but in our peers. This slide, there's 20, 37 Act counties, but we wanted to include our local jurisdictions, our larger cities, because they are, they are one of our major competitors for talent. So to get it on one slide, we have, I believe, 10 of our 37 Act counties. But again, note that our formula is still the, the, the second lowest of the others that aren't in this slide. But we have 10 37 Act counties, we have six cities, and then we have Ventura County. As you can see here, um, we are the lowest, second lowest formula. Kern recently implemented a tier two about two years back, and that's a slightly lower formula than ours. It's perspective for new employees. And Matt, that's very significant for the public to know that, you know, because uh, the, the thought is that our county employees earn a lot of money, and, and you can see that they're, after they okay. retire, that they don't. Okay. So. so the formula is very important, and you have down the left there again colas, and you'll see. Even in the Ventura County city jurisdictions, you see down around 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, all the cities in Ventura County have COLAs with their pensions. We do not. So low on formula, no COLA. This slide kind of summarizes the, the detail of our peers. When we look for safety members, uh, it is the lowest absolute formula among all the 37 Act counties. And it's also the lowest of all jurisdictions in Ventura County. So this is a summary for safety. You can see the formulas there on the right. Ventura County, of the 16 peers looked at, we are the lowest at 2% at 50 and 2.6% at 55 for public safety. The thing about uh, uh, a little nuance or uh, a difference with public safety is it does have a COLA associated with it. And, but as do all the other jurisdictions of its peers. Just some other points we want to make about public safety and why they're formula and why they're treated a bit different. First of all, they have long careers here. 24 years is the average career. You saw the average manager, I think, has 16 years. Um, the average other county employee, about 18 years. The average career in public safety is 24 years. We have a significant amount of benefit or, or training and investment in those folks. So we look at them a little different. They take risks as part of their job. That's inherent in their job. And public safety is, and, and we don't uh, uh, claim otherwise for the county, it's a priority. And as a result of the actions taken for your board, by your board over the years and your board's predecessors, we're one of the safest counties in the country. Uh, competitive, you remember back in the early 2000s how difficult it was for the sheriff to recruit deputies. So we need to remain competitive because as the economy turns around, we'll be right back in that same situation if we slip off the track for our safety folks. Again, they voluntarily reopen their contracts. Uh, or, last year uh, to take increase or to pick up the in, uh, increased retirement contributions that others did. So that both the firefighters and the uh, sheriff's deputies open their contracts. And they do not participate in Social Security. So those are some of the things to just take into account when you realize the difference between Social Security and they're, they're and the other And they're also exposed to more potential health consequences as relating to their job specifically. Yes. Okay, so that's the formulas. Now let's go ahead and look at comp earnable. We said we we're a little high in comp earnable, comp earnable, and comp earnable is a term used to define how much of your compensation goes toward pension. And we are a bit higher, and that's for uh, three primary reasons. First, the state Supreme Court directed us back in 1997 in what's known as the Ventura decision, and your board is very familiar with that, to include other forms of regular cash compensation as part of the uh, 
compensable earnings of an employee. Those are things like uniform allowance. Those are things like uh, anything that's a regular car, uh, uh, a regular allowance for uh, an employer, a regular cash contribution. Um, what were some of the others we listed in the board? Uh, bilingual pay. Uh, the uh, vacation redemption, of course, is included in that. So that's uh, the primary factor, one of the primary factors. Uh, the second factor I just mentioned is the redemption of the accrued leave. Uh, what we're looking at today, the exact thing we're looking at today, is a material factor in our compensation earnings being hired. And then finally, the pickup of the employee's portion of retirement contribution and the benefits flex credit. Both of those are treated as compensation earnable here at Ventura County. And that's a little unique to us, but those are part of that, one of the three reasons that, uh, that cause our comp earnable to be a little higher. Excuse me, Mr. Carroll. You yes. just mentioned that's, that's sort of unique, and I know I heard the Taxpayers Association representative. On that last one, the other 37 Act counties doing the third bullet point there? Yeah, we are running that down this morning, Steve, and we, okay. we, we could have it this morning to confirm whether that's the case or not. That's the one piece of data we haven't gone after at this point. Thank but I, we know it's not common. Uh-huh, right. Let me, let me just say, Matt, um, <clears throat> because this can get complicated if you don't deal with this on a regular basis. I think the <laughs> easiest way to say it is anything that we pay to an employee is cash. Flex credit goes in as a cash, and they use it any way they can. Is what what this county says is earnable towards pension, right? Is that the easiest way to say it? Yes. Without all the other things. Yes. Yeah. Knowing that cash isn't and necessarily cash is made the up third by all these it, different but, yeah. things, yeah. but the easiest way to say it is yes. cash. That way, for some understand. While we're on that, and so it, I would assume because of the Ventura decision that any 37 Act county that pays something in cash has to make it comp earnable. Is that correct, County Council? Or is that two? For almost everything, uh, two exclusions, the uh, major one being overtime. Okay. But general rule is cash to the employees, incomparable for all 37 ad counts. Okay. There you go. But let's, let's be clear. We don't have to do a gross-up by that cash. We don't have to do that, but that's not how we cash. The other thing we don't have to do is the employee portion of retirement. That's not a 30, that's not a... The Ventura decision issue, right? Well, what, once you do it, the way to understand the employee payments to third parties does not count as cash to the employee. Cash to the employee. So, flex credits by and large are paid to insurance companies for health insurance, and the employee pickup or employer pickup is paid to the retirement plan. So, those two payments do not have to count as compensation earnable <laughs> under the court decision, right? Even though but we pay them out as cash, to th third that, that's a decision here at the county. Okay. But Matt, are those uh, for non-management um, employees are MOU negotiable. They well, the, we are we are waiting on opinion on the last one. We believe all of these have to be bargained. Yes, because they It'll are be MOU. Okay. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Good questions. Now you would think, based on that last slide, that compensation earnable being higher automatically equates to a higher pension amount if your salary is higher or your comp earnable is higher. And what we wanted to show here was something that opened our eyes. And I'll just point to the two highlighted lines. The first highlighted line for four 37 Act counties, San Diego, Santa Barbara, Kern, and ourselves. And we actually did this for 13 of the 37 Act counties. And this took a lot of digging through the, through the actuary report. So we stopped at 13. But uh, you'll see that the first line shows the average projected compensation earnings for current employees right out of the actuary report. This is what the actuary report is basing future obligations, this first line. So you can see Ventura County, just like we talked about, is a bit higher in, in uh, projected compensation for retirement purposes, 73000 versus 62000 for San Diego, 68000 for Santa Barbara, and 62000 for Kern. The second highlighted line is the average annual benefit of current retirees. So you would think if our comp earner, earnable is higher, our, our pensions would be higher. And you can see that's not the case. The average pension, 18,000. Uh, the average uh, pension in San Diego County, 28,000. Santa Barbara County, 27,000. And Kern, 32,000. So this is for non-safety. This is for general members, average pensions, and, and uh, they're comp earnable at the top. So because of our modest formula and some of our other modest uh, components that you'll see go into it, uh, it offsets to a large degree the, the higher comp earnable that we but have the, for our employees. But Matt, 18 is the 80% of the employees, right? 
Yes, basically. exactly. Tier so, two so employees. That's you know that's that's a pretty low amount compared yes. to other counties. So. Yeah. So that was an eye opener for us. That's right. Okay, so that's the comp earnable issue. We now we just want to quickly touch excuse upon me. some of the others. And excuse we me, mentioned Mr. Carroll. Yes, could you just go back one? How do you explain the difference? I mean, the projected compensation is higher, but for the past retirees, it's lower. How, how do you do? do uh, you, well, you guys have gathered a ton of data and done a ton of analysis, so I know we just keep asking more. Yeah. But it, what do you think accounts for for that? It's it's the lower formula is a big factor in but, that but case. But the average projected compensation, wouldn't that, is that just what it's going to be based on without formula? Right. Oh, that's, that's the projected income. That's project. That's projected that's right. that's comp the, earnable. That their formula will be applied against when they retire. Got it. Okay. All right. So, right. And, and so even with the higher formula, when you, I mean, even with the higher comp earnable, when you put the formula to it, it's going to come out with a lower. The lowest yes. average, yeah. Got it. And, and what we're sparing you is the detail of the other 12 or 11 counties that we looked at. Right. But how did it turn out in those counties? It's the same formula. One other county had a smaller retirement than we did, Mendocino County. Other than that? Yes. So of all those 13, only one other. Now, besides that, Steve, this is um, an uh, average retiree. All those others have COLAs. That's so true. besides we... Our, our employees stay down at their original our, 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 our retirement amounts, the vast majority of them, while these others are getting a bump every year. So in the mm -hmm. 2010 actuary report, many of those employees had years of bumps behind them. Hey, let, me, let me ask Matt so I can clearly. When you write average annual benefit in that last yellow line that says 18, 28, is that the average benefit get, persons getting in that county? Is that what you're saying? That is the average retiree compensation. But it's not a compensation of taking, if you, re, if you work here 30 years, retire at 60 years old, and uh, you start at 30, retired at 60, you get 2% times the 7.3. 7, that's not what, no. that, that's not what the, to look at that. So if you were to put those real numbers in, we're 15% higher than everybody else's average compensation. We're 0.33 percent lower than other people, but if you calculate it, where would our pensions be? Just taking. Well, you saw it, 33,000. If you took an average, we had a few slides back. Okay, but you could do the same yeah, thing. I mean, for, but that's an average. I was just saying, if you take right. the exact number. But Matt, numbers. you can do the same thing for other cities. Too. I don't want to get too detailed yes. on this, but anyway, I was just yes. curious. The reality is, our higher comp earnable is overtaken in in about three years by a cola. That's right. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's, there's no question. Cola is probably the most expensive piece to all this. There's no Which we don't have. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure we're, what I was looking at. Okay. So we were going to, just quickly on the next two slides, just show you some, some detail behind the data where we said we're the only cola. That's the first column of uh, all the jurisdictions, the peer jurisdictions, cities, and 10 of the 37 Act counties. You can see we're half... Uh, the folks have retiree medical, or half of those other jurisdictions have retiree medical. Social Security participation, same thing. Half have Social Security participation, and half have a deferred comp match. So it really means the formula and the high comp earnables are, are the, the two overriding. We're about average on most of the others, uh, oh, excuse me, and COLA. So. All right, so that's the background on the other pension components. Let's look at our annual leave redemption program now take all these factors and apply them against the program. Just a little bit of history is stated in the board letter. The Leave Redemption Program was created in 1977, and it was created uh, to take the, the annual leave and the sick leave, the vacation leave, combine it into one pool. Uh, at that same time, managers were allowed to buy down 40 hours. Now, that same program was offered to our unions, and they declined it at the time. So the Annual Leave Redemption Program and the concept of annual leave, one pool for vacation and sick, uh, is limited to managers at this point, but they have the opportunity to pick it up. Over the course of the 80s, for the next 12 years up through 1989, or next 11 years, the amount of accrual amount and the amount of leave you could redeem was bumped up by the board at various points in times in lieu of salary increases. And at the time, that was very common because it's less expensive to give you additional leave than give you cash. At the time, it didn't count toward comp earnable. So when they increased it, it didn't have an impact on t retirement. 
And at the time, you didn't, well, you still don't, you don't pay taxes. You don't pay payroll taxes on increased leave amounts. So the board actually experienced cost savings by giving increased leave and the annual redemption. You don't pay Social Security or, or uh, taxes on those payroll items as you increase the leave amounts. Uh, eventually, over the course of uh, that same period of time, many of our unions join the leave redemption and vacation redemption program, and you can see now it's resulted in the, in the amounts listed on this slide. They range from 80 for many of our organizations, that's the amount that they can they buy down on an annual basis, to uh, 160 for your typical manager, 200 hours for your older managers that have been here a long time, and up to 280 hours for a line battalion chief, and that's unique to the amount of hours they worked in their schedule. But for the vast majority of managers and people covered by this, it's 160 hours that you can sell down a year. Okay. The last change to the program was in uh, 2004 when your board made that uh, or decreased the amount that could be sold back by the managers from 200 to 160 hours. Now, this slide lists the redemption amounts, uh, the total leave uh, accruals that can occur, and redemption amounts for, again, uh, those six local jurisdictions. I, actually, I think we cut it down to four local jurisdictions at this point, uh, and 10 of, uh, 10 of uh, the 37 Act counties and the city of Santa Barbara. We added them back into it. So you can see the average buy-down for managers midway at the bottom of the screen, or the redemption amount is 84 hours, and for executives, it's 103 hours. So that gives you some lay of the land of, of what uh, occurs in the public sector. You've heard that this isn't available in the private sector. So we did a quick pulse check. We went out to some of our largest employers, and you can't find this data from every employer. It's not public information. But we did find from uh, two of the three we checked with, there were leave redemption programs in the private sector. Cottage Health Hospital, or Cottage Health Health Systems, Health Systems in Santa Barbara, and Los Robles Hospital uh, down in TO have leave redemption programs. Uh, Amgen does not. So those were the three larger employers we checked with. You can see the amounts there, 180 at Cottage and 72 at Los Robles. So with that, we took all those components, we took where the employees pay were, we took where our competitors were, and we came up with the recommendations here this morning. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Michael. Two more. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm out of sequence in my book. Um, within the board letter, we took an example uh, of taking the recommendations today and applying it to a typical manager. And that typical manager has 20 years of service, and this could be a manager or anybody confidential, clerical, and representing that MOU, and age 61. And the bottom line is it reduces their pension amounts by approximately 6.4%. It reduces their comp earnable by about 6.5%. So the pension amount decreases from 42,300 a year to 39,600 a year. Not an insignificant impact, and that's on a typical manager. One of the things we also wanted to see is what does this do to the outliers? There's been a lot of discussion with, about outliers in the $200,000 club. This is a lot of data, but you can read it a bit uh, more clearly in your, in your handout. Uh, the fourth column from the right lists, well, first of all, there's 22, uh, $200,000 and over. And, and some have 24, some have 22. The difference is the, 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 the additional two that came in over 200,000 came in because of a county benefit that terminates. And that would be the, the something called cost or care. So we remove that because it's not a permanent benefit and we have 22 people over 200,000. The fourth column from the right shows what their current retired benefit is. The, second col the, the fifth column from the right shows what their retirement would be just with, if these recommendations were applied to their career. Now these are all executives. I think you noted in the board letter that the, the impact on executives is slightly higher. Well, the decrease there is approximately 8%. So this impacts those executives over their career by about 8%. What that would have done was reduce the number of public safety folks that were over 200,000 from 15 to 10 and tier one executives from seven down to two. So we'd only have two general managers in the $200,000 and over range. 
Now what's really eye-opening is if you take the second to last column on the right and you said, what if you combine that with Tier 2? Because the vast majority of your managers are going to be retiring on Tier 2 from this point forward. The decrease averages 25%. So the combination of what we're recommending today and Tier 2, your board's already done Tier 2, it's a 25% average reduction. There will be one employee who's not a safety member over the $200,000 club. And the dollar amount is going to be very significant in that 25%. Yes. You can see the average pension amount went from 220000 for general managers to 166000 mm -hmm. Could I ask, um, I, we do get comments about, well, you know, that we're sitting up here and there are people out there that are making over $200,000 a year. These were essentially contracts that were established with these employees that we can't change, if we, even if we wanted to. Is that correct? Yes. That's we believe that's the case, and that's we've run that by council on several opinions, and based on Supreme Court decision, yes. And it's mm -hmm. basically the result of previous boards of supervisors, you know, allowing for the contracts to go where they went. And, 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 the, and as well the, as the, the, the court decision, the Ventura that, decision, Ventura decision. Yes. the Ventura decision that allowed for all cash payment to be pensionable. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But anyway, this was a big eye opener to us. We wanted to share that. And with that, now, Michael, I'll turn it back over to my boss. Thank you. <laughs> well, in a, if I, if I can, too, just along the same lines, the fact that we have established really clear understanding now of, of what items are pensionable that can be changed that aren't vested, it gives us this um, really good analysis. And I just also want to thank you and staff for providing this incredibly detailed, helpful information that allows us to reach better decisions. And not only us, I was just thinking, listening to this, you know, particularly with doing all these comparisons, you know, it also helps our peer cities and counties to see what is the market and, and a, a, a lot clearer picture than I've ever seen before. You know, and, and I know it's, we've done this for the last couple of months uh, working on this together. But it is um, very valuable information, and I just really appreciate the good work. And um, we, uh, as Supervisor Van was saying, we keep asking for more. <laughs> but this has really given us a, a great uh, you know, view of what needs to be done, what we can do legally, and, uh, and also in comparison to what others, other cities and counties have. So thank you for that. And, and I think, too, it's good information for our bargaining units to look at. You know, so it's important that, uh, that we do work with, with those folks, too. You know. Absolutely. Just to wrap up, uh, <clears throat> so you see 95 percent of the uh, employees covered under the management resolution are in this Tier 2 uh, system, one of only 16 peer groups without a cost of living adjustment, no retirement, no medical benefit. The one area where we're relatively high, that's one of the things we're addressing with this action. It targets this area exactly. Uh, the employer pickup of the employee share is also something that's important and that your board and our county family and, and labor unions have worked on. As you can see, uh, SEIU and CNA and other unions there and the top level, about six of the unions have, uh, for existing employees, reduced it from 4 to 1 percent. And for new employees, it's zero, so the new employees pick up their entire portion. Uh, for the managers, uh, in 2010, they agreed to pick up all but 2.7, and for new employees, all but 1.7. And then you see our deputy sheriff and fire association also uh, moving towards picking up more of their share of the pension costs. Uh, and as Mr. Carroll identified, the outliers are, are issues, and, and some of our recommendations here today help address those issues. So uh, the only last thing I'll say is uh, we appreciate that what we're trying to do is strike a balance, uh, transparency, fiscal sustainability, while at the same time maintaining, com being competitive and retaining and continuing to recruit a very high caliber county management team here that along with your board has helped put Ventura County in good, solid financial footing. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, a couple folks or just some of the groups for helping us get here because there's been a lot of uh, data gathered and information, as the supervisor said. Uh, our, our department heads, our management team, our labor partners, Taxpayers Association, uh, our board, and thank you for your time and, and going through all this detailed information with us over the last year. And also to Mr. Carroll, Catherine Rodriguez, and Tabine Cosio uh, for gathering this data. And I, you know, th this is, these are important steps, but we also know there's an ongoing discussion that's going to take place, and, and we look forward to continuing that dialogue with our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And um, <clears throat> to the folks that are time certain, you know, we're running a little late, but uh, we do have uh, 
Board members, a couple of speakers on this item is, uh, and and I think if I'm reading this correctly, is either Dick or, or uh, Thompson. Dick Thompson. Dick Thompson. Sorry, there. Thank you. It looked and like Dick yeah. The K. name is Dick Thompson. It looked like Dick K. Case, but that, that, oh, that's oh, fine. That's fine. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to. Uh, to speak this morning, uh, a year ago this board undertook an effort to address pension reform um, and um, frankly uh, we've looked at the report and at least the best that we can say on behalf of the uh, Ventura County Taxpayers Association is that we're simply we're disappointed. Uh, we think that what we have here really is a missed opportunity. Um, a couple of points. Um, we know that in the last 10 years, uh, the number of people that are earning $100,000 or more in retirement has doubled. Uh, we also know that a couple of weeks ago it was reported in the STAR that the increased level of contribution to the retirement system will be $9 million. And there are also reports in the paper that actually that rate will, uh, will increase in the following two years. Um, it, it's our view that given the time horizon of this proposal, uh, nothing is being done to address that cost. Uh, this, this proposal talks about improvements that will occur 15 to 20 years from now, long after uh, you or I will be, uh, will be in this room. Um, secondly, we think that uh, certainly the analysis done by Mr. Dursey is, is, is a good one. We'd like to have a copy of it uh, because what he's provided here is uh, certainly very, very thorough, but as for the report that was made available publicly, uh, there are a number of uh, things that we think uh, uh, are a little of concern. One is, uh, let's just talk about vesting. There's a number of things that were said about vesting in there. Um, you know, we're not questioning anyone's integrity, but you have a legal opinion from someone who benefits from the system. That is at least a conflict of interest, and we believe that you ought to be doing something to... Uh, to look outside the, uh, the county to get a better opinion. There is another comment in there about uh, uh, the 3% uh, that was negotiated with, in, uh, with uh, unrepresented employees in terms of their contribution to their pensions. Um, I, I, I question whether it was actually negotiated with uh, those people, uh, and it's, it's difficult to see how that is also not affecting by uh, some of these vesting rights. So there seems to be a conflict of there. You talk about, uh, and you point to this, safety does not have, uh, they, they, they're not in the Social Security system. That's correct. They also do not contribute at a level to their pensions that is anywhere near what a normal Social Security recipient uh, contributes. Everyone in this room that's not a safety employee who earns a paycheck is contributing 6.5% of their salary to uh, to Social Security, and we don't see that at all with the safety employees. And that takes me to the last point. Um, you know, our concern is certainly about today, but it's also about those future contracts uh, that w were noted by uh, Mr. Powers. Um, we think that this does very little to provide leverage for this body to deal with uh, the unions in future negotiations as far as uh, their benefits. Um, and. And so we, we, we ask that this body reject this proposal. It's just simply not good enough. Uh, send it back. Um, it's taken a year to get to this point. Um, it has a time horizon of 15 to 20 years, so it doesn't sound like anybody's in too big a hurry here. So I would just recommend that you uh, reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dick. Do we have uh, David Grahl? Good morning. I'm David Grau with the Taxpayer Association. Um, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time working with the county and uh, with the community on uh, what we feel are areas that can be reformed in pension. Uh, obviously, the, the area you're looking at today is very important. The concern we have is that it only applies to new employees, employees generally that don't even work here yet. Um, and at the same time, like uh, uh, Mr. Thompson mentioned, it appears that you're carving out a group of employees who are unrepresented at will to somehow all of a sudden have vested rights to their pensions or pension benefits that we're looking at. Um, 
Now, the county likes to use averages, which is good. And uh, what we like to do, what we've been doing, is kind of breaking those averages down. We don't disagree. The vast majority of county employees uh, under SEIU uh, have very modest pension benefits. What we started to look at is the outliers, what drives up the average. And what's driving up the average is very obviously two groups, the safety group, and really within the safety group, the fire group, much more than the sheriffs. And the particular uh, method that the fire group uses, uh, I know we talked about uh, certain things are included and not included in comp earnable. We said overtime isn't, but some overtime is. And the one form that is included is schedule overtime. And we found one firefighter who retired with $92,000 of scheduled overtime in his last year. He ended up with a pension equal to 884% of his base pay. Those are the outliers we're looking at. The other group that we feel that there is some abuse is the management group, the unrepresented group. And you are, look, you are addressing part of that with your looking at the vacation accrual. But the, the one aspect that I think we're overlooking, and it was mentioned by Mr. Carroll, and it's unique to Ventura County as far as we know, is the employer pickup. And that's the only, as far as we know, only 37 at county out of the 20 counties in the California that continue to use the employer pickup to spike their pensions. Now this is something that the board can take an action on. They could have taken an action on it 10 years ago or 12 years ago, but it hasn't happened. As far as we know, and I know Mr. Carroll's gonna validate our information, every other board in the state has already taken this action. Now, who's the beneficiary of this? There's two groups that benefit most, public safety, because they pay the smallest share of their pension contribution. Now what you do, you'll take that portion that the county picks up instead of the employee in that say, let's say 10% that we're paying instead of them, that's grossed up by 133%. So they get a 13% boost in their comp earnable, which boosts their pension. Okay, we'll have to talk with Mike about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's shaking his head. But anyway, okay, I'm sorry. And the other group over and above management is the Board of Supervisors. Four of the five members of the Board of Supervisors participate in the pension plan. Four of the five members also get a benefit from including the employer pickup in their pension. Those members can decide, no, we don't need to do this. We can draw the line, at least at our level, the elected officials, and say, first of all, why should an elected official get a pension? And second of all, why should they participate in pension spiking? I think if the, the uh, board addresses this issue, the employer pickup, which clearly the county is an outlier, I think that would make significant reform. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, David. I uh, think we should have a staff response before we go to the board. Do you want to respond to that, uh, Michael or Matt, to any of the comments that were shared by the... Uh... Just a couple of points. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Appreciate uh, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Brown's comments. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, and in terms of the time horizon of reducing costs, we're talking about one group here. Uh, and uh, I think there is significant savings in the first year. 450 to 600,000 seems fairly significant to me. Uh, and then that grows every year after that to mm -hmm. up to, to $9 million. And that's just for this group. And that's something that we've already said we're going to work on. Uh, and talk with our, our labor partners about as well. So uh, just respectfully disagree there. And in terms of uh, how we're funding the pension too, our pension has one of the lowest amortization periods of any in the, in the state. And so for example, when you have unfunded liabilities, many of the pension systems have 30 year payment horizons that they amortize on. Ours is 15, one of the lowest. So I think we are very much, and our county is very much interested in maintaining our healthy pension costs today, not just 20 years from now, but today. I uh, just wanted to mention, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the legal opinion, uh, you know, I, I, I just, the notion that there's a conflict, I mean, I just respectfully disagree with that. Um, Mr. Smith is an extremely honorable man and an excellent attorney and uh, really was out front in identifying these legal issues, uh, actually, which were later on echoed by the Legislative Analyst Office in their report. And as a, as a previous attorney, I've rarely seen that level of agreement in terms of the vested, the strength of the vested nature of these rights. It was very, very clear. Uh, and in terms of 
uh, the abuses are spiking. I guess I object to those terms because you know what you've got is very hard, very hardworking firefighters and managers here in our yeah. county, uh, and so I, I object to the term spiking or abuses. Uh, these were the compensation arrangements uh, that were given to them, offered to them, and accepted. This was the arrangement that they made. Now we're talking about making adjustments. That's great. Let's have that discussion. Uh, but in a, in a positive approach. You know, I just want to share real quick on the firefighter end of it. I know that they have worked with us. You know, they did work with us on the on the three percent reduction. But I think it's important. I, to me anyway, personally, not because I'm elected official, but as a personal uh, a person, those firefighters when I dial nine one one, they have saved my dad. They have saved my son. They have saved my my wife. And 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 to say, you know, that. Uh, that um, they are not helping, I don't think it's an injustice to those individuals because when all of you right here, when you dial 911, you want a firefighter and, 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 and a sheriff right at your house within three to four or five minutes. I just wanted to share that part of it. But, uh, and I think that uh, that this proposal is, that is being proposed today is, uh, is going to benefit all of us in the long run with the new hires uh, after uh, April the 5th. You know, it's, it's going to limit, you know, the hours that uh, our individual can sell from, uh, uh, for one year. And I think that uh, instead of two years, and I think it's going to be an immediate savings for the, uh, for the county. And in the long run, it's going to help us tremendously. And I know that our bargaining people will help us in the future. So I just want to show that. Yeah. And, and if I, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. If I may, just real quick. Uh, there were several points I wanted to make sure I responded to as many as I could. Uh, on the issue of the employer pickup of the employee portion, and I'm talking slowly here so I can get to the last slide, um, I think what you uh, see is that, in fact, this is something that uh, this board and this county management team and the county workforce and labor unions here have worked towards. So you see uh, in the top left-hand uh, corner there, the box, those are six of the county's nine, ten bargaining units. And for new employees, it's zero going forward. Mm -hmm. And for employees under this uh, management resolution going forward, it's 1.73. It's very close to zero. And you see significant progress made with our safety partners as well. So I just want to highlight that we understand what you're saying. Uh, progress is being made. And we will get back to you on the data that you, that you requested. Uh, Mr. Mr. Let me. Uh, I appreciate the comments. Those are great comments we had out there. And, and to answer just a couple things, I think what Supervisor Parks was asking is the Ventura. It's the Vicera decision. It's our. It's our request. We can make ask for Vicera to change that decision. That's one thing we can do because it's picked up. So that's one of the issues. The other thing I think was interesting for Fire was um, Fire only can pay overtime on scheduled overtime. So I want to be careful that we understand that piece of it. That they're not. You know, if somebody gets. 500 hours of non schedule So that's one of the pieces. So we have that balance of understanding it. But we have, you know, this is some issues. Mike, if you can go back, flip through there again. I'd like to go to 9 and 10, if you could, because I thought there was, you, you made some uh, interesting comparisons of averages and then what's happened in the last five years. You're not going to be able to get that? Speak slowly. Speak slowly. It's coming. You took it off. Okay. Thank you. Because it was interesting what I what I saw here, and I was looking, doing some calculations. It says on our average, we were 18 years and 35 thousand dollars. Now, in the last five years, our average of time in is 19 years. If we if you go to number 10, if you can, uh, yeah, but yeah, probably we'll quicker, back it up. Probably back it up. Yeah, be, uh, oh well. Anyway. <laughs> Technology is so wonderful when you can. There go. Hang on. You keep going. <laughs> All right. There you go. Yeah, I'm making the picture go past. Yeah, it'll, it'll show up. All right. Anyway, the average was that we went up on an average one year. We went up 5% an average of time worked. We're up 20%. Here we go right here. Here we're up 20% in pension received, just on the average. So we want to make sure that we're, we're clear. Safety, if we look at that, the, and, and number nine, it was 24 years. Number 10 here, it's still 24 years. And they're up to 92 from 80. So that's 15% increase. Not the highest. A lot of people think safety is the highest, but it's not always the highest. But then look at tier one. Tier one, and, and this is where I think we see these outliers, and I know part of this is working on this, and it's a very small portion of our deal.
but if you go look and you say back in in on page nine we had 21 years and we moved to 26 years we had a 15 percent increase in number of years worked however we have a 60 percent increase in the amount of pension increase does that make sense it, it does, yeah. except that that's the program that was closed in 1970. I understand. Sir. I understand. So I'd say it's a very small portion. But I think some of these outliers are there, and this is what you know, makes it a little bit more difficult. When all of a sudden you say in the last five years, somebody, we only had an increase of 15% working, but we got a 60% increase in the amount of pension. It's a big issue. But years ago, people took the advantage, or supervisors saw that we've got to get through that, a few, few people. But then on, on, tier, on tier two, which is we know is our lowest portion, we had 15 years now, and we had uh, average of 13. So we had a 15% increase in the amount of years worked, still with a 30% increase in pension. There's no question, pensions are going up. Let's just be straight out with it. Pensions are going up, and it's our job to try to control some of this cost long term. And I think the other side of this, when somebody says the average tier two person is getting 23 years, and I thought the taxpayers were very generous in the idea was modest pensions. I mean, 23,000 modest pensions. Yeah, that is true. But if we take the private sector employee, they may have zero pension, a little bit of my 401k, plus my Social Security. So there is, there's no question that the, the, the uh, public has been generous to the public employee in that sense. There's a double in the sense the private sector gets hopefully their 401k and hopefully their Social Security. That's what they get. Here in the public sector, we get 401k, Social Security, plus a pension. So there's additional benefits that are going in there. But we have been modest, and one of the things over the years, this board has tried to keep some of those things down. And now we have an opportunity to try to look at how we can still find ways to control it. Um, we have, and I want to use the, the word carefully, that we've scratched the surface on trying to do some of these, these things. This has taken a year. It's taken a long time. I do have to compliment the CEO's office. There is a lot of information that was put out. I mean, you should see the binder of stuff. And as you can see, we're still up here trying, okay, what exactly is this? There's a lot of information, a lot of things were implemented um, and trying to understand it. For somebody like myself who's been here five years, wow, it's, it, it's crazy how some of these things are done. I mean, as they say, only can happen in government, which is true. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, but we are in a position to tr hopefully try to get a little bit done right now but I believe we need to do more. We've got to continue down that path because anybody will tell you, as you see the tax revenue is going like this and pensions going like that, the average public is going to start to see the difference. We are not seeing it here in, in uh, this county, as, as Mike told us. So many other counties are already seeing it. Uh, Supervisor Parks talked about $200 million deficit coming this year for L.A. It's going to be an... Uh, huh? And it's going to double next year. So, I mean, I remember talking to one of the people running for mayor, and I said, is, L is L.A. going to have a problem going broke? He said, I think it's going to be around uh, the thir um, 13. It's going to be, you know, 2013 because they got huge $400 million coming due. Where do you come up with $400 million when revenues aren't coming? This is why it's important. And we're asking people like the fire department, the sheriffs, and just this own group of employees to try to find every dollar we can to help keep the public as safe as possible when they need it, keep roads repaired, keep all the services going, and pension costs are eating this up. So we have to find a balance. And I, I appreciate everybody working hard to try to work this, but we've got to, we have just kind of, like I said, put the periscope up out of the water and it's just starting to show. We've got more to do, and I like what Mike has said here, we want to look at other actions that we need to take uh, to do more. And I know that that's what the CEO's office is going to do, and I'm hoping we can propose those ASAP. Because it takes, it takes time to get this effect. We have got to be, come to a point. I know talking to the sheriff the other, the other day, when the previous sheriff's there, he had to find, I think, $5 million. And then the last you know, couple of years, another five and five. At some point, you can't find more. Uh, Paul Grossgold and, and IT with Mike Pettis, they found a whole lot of money for us to try to help offset some of those issues. But at some point, you can't continue to find that money. And we've got to figure out if this is what's eating our uh, eating our. Uh, our lunch in the sense we've got to control our appetite a little bit on this and do it so I appreciate where we're going but again we need to do a lot more thank you super much Mike just one last point to, uh, I've been told I wasn't as clear as I could have been on this but just for managers under the management MOU you see the, the issue of the employer pickup of the employee portion has been substantially addressed it's gone from 5.73 to 1.73 that's so, right a lot of progress Supervisor Parks and 
what what lies in Visera, and you, you sit on there with us, is they, they actually can make some decisions that would help this and too. And a lot of those decisions can come from us as a board to recommend that we do certain things to make that. Now we don't we don't have all the votes, but mm -hmm. we, we can try to make those. I think it's some things we have to do. Because I think if we look at employer pickup throughout this whole county, all the different agencies and all the different union groups, Mike could say that's a Got to be worth millions to us every year, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, and I would say that the action that, that the, the county family and your board took in 2010, right there, that saved the county $12 million a year. Mm -hmm. $12 million a year. $12 million a year. Yeah. And the action already taken. That was this, by uh, reducing or them putting in more of their own. Increasing their, their contribution to retirement right. system. And, and that's part of it. The employees have picked up and tried to help. If we reduced, if we got rid of employer pickup, it doesn't take away anybody's pay right now. It, it does affect their pension, but it doesn't take away what they're using to live and eat and, and enjoy their life right now. It, it, it affects the future. But that future we're paying for right now. Hmm. And so I think we've got some opportunities to look at those kind of changes that, that we can move forward um, and, and, and try, to, try to do it. Because at the end of the day, our job here is if we want to have a sustainable pension program, we do not want to be in some of the positions San Jose, Stockton, some of the other cities, one city in, what is it, in Alabama who just stopped paying their pensions altogether because they decided, do I put cops on the street and firefighters or do I pay pensions? They decided to pay, do it. And, that, and we're, we don't want to. One thing about it, this current CEO's office, this board and the future boards have kept this county in a very good position, and I appreciate that. Doing a good job. But it can go south pretty quick, and we've got to be careful that we do the right things going forward. Mm -hmm. You look at some of the decisions that are facing the city of Los Angeles, they're looking at the potential of doing, not doing emergency medical transport. You know, I mean, the major things that you expect of, you know, core government services. The core of government. Yeah, right, the core of government. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate your comments. Um, I want to do one thing so I, so I don't... Um, uh, I, I don't forget it. Just uh, there's just one one thing I think we, we have up there. 2001 in terms of the issue. I, I know I talked to um, CEO about it. 2001 in terms of the elected officials buyback, and and we we replaced that with a supplement which we took away in 2004. Uh, just uh, just for the record, I want to want to get that get that set. Um, but uh, there, there's I'd like to start with some compliments. One, I appreciate your comments, and I think that um, you know you talk about a a complicated issue and a difficult issue and we've been we've been wrestling we've had lots of conversations uh, uh, about it and and I hear what you're saying and and uh, uh, agree today is not the end of you know that this is the this is uh, another step and I think this board has taken many steps that is that has gotten us to the point where the taxpayers association can come up here and say f many of your pensions are modest Right, um, but there we have a, we have a problem with, with outliers, and so this is a step, and there is more that needs to be done. Um, so uh, compliments there. I want to compliment the Taxpayers Association. Um, your comments are clear, and uh, and uh, you you you've, you've focused on things, and you, you you've raised uh, you've raised that focus on on things, and I think. Uh, um, that's been helpful for the discussion overall and, 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 and good for the board. And then third, I want to compliment the CEO's office. Um, this is a complicated topic, uh, and I think that the idea of let's make sure we get our hands around the whole program. Let's understand where we are, where we are, uh, where we have a better <laughs> system uh, and where we have room for improvement. And make sure we understand the whole package because this is a complicated issue with lots of moving parts in it, so, so to speak, as, as we go forward. Um, so um, uh, those, those are overall things that I'd like to say. I, I think that um, <coughs> My, my view about uh, uh, about this from an overall standpoint is that there are, as the CEO's office has pointed out, and as the Taxpayers Association has said, there are many things about our pension system that result in modest pensions that virtually everybody can support. Um, there is one thing in our pension system that I think is a problem, and that's these outlier pensions uh, that, that are out there. We all know what they are. We all know... Um, uh, what the, the, those outlier pensions, and they're they're not it, it, they're not the thousands of people in the system, but they are eroding support 
for those modest pensions for the average employee that is out there. And I think it's in everybody's interest that's involved in county government or, or lives in Ventura County for us to um, correct that because you can't in the long run erode that support um, for the overall pension system with these outliers that are out there. So I see today as a 7% cut. That's not an insignificant cut. It's a 7% cut, if I have this correct from the CEO's office, uh, that we're making, number one. And that's a, that's a step, but, but we're not finished with the things that we have to do. The question is, what are the next steps? When do we take them? Right? And very importantly, something that was raised by the Taxpayer Association that I don't think is the case is um, you made the comment that you thought we were carving out a special group of unrepresented employees for vested benefits. And what I think we very clearly, and this was one of the things that uh, it was absolutely essential to me for today's action, is that we say these are not vested benefits. These are, this is a decision we're making today and making sure that we have the right to change this decision in the future based on what we see happening um, in the fall. And I, I want to talk about that. So uh, I don't believe we're carving out. In fact, it's the intention of the board to do just the opposite, which is to make sure that whatever action we take today is not, does not lock in or it's not permanent so that as things change, we can, we can continue to make changes. That's been probably one of the biggest frustrations everybody's had is when you find these outliers and then you say, well, they're vested, you can't do anything about them. And so we're, we're not going to, we're not perpetuating that in this situation. I think we have, um, as the CEO's office pointed out, in terms of, of the, the, the going forward, we have the governor's proposal and the legislature just came up with uh, uh, a position this morning, uh, I heard. We have the governor's proposal and the state action. And we've had some very healthy conversations about, you know, we may do some things today that may actually increase our pension costs based on what the, what the governor does in the fall, whereas we may be better off seeing what that action is, and then we can make better adjustments as, as we go forward. So that's one, is to see where that is. And two, uh, to see where it, 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 what, see what the um, where we end up in terms of the specific pension reforms at the table uh, that we are negotiating, that we are, are, are successful in terms of negotiating, because that will influence what we do with unrepresented also. And so um, I just want to emphasize we're not done. We've got two big moving parts out there that have a significant influence on where uh, we go uh, want, you know, with, with unrepresented employees, and that is the, the state action by both the legislature and the governor, and the other is by what happens at the table as we have negotiations come forward uh, at the table. And I think those are things that we've recognized, and that's part of why we said as long as this is a temporary step and not a vested step that we can't make future adjustments to, this is a, this is the, a good first step um, uh, effort for us to make, but there is more to be done, particularly with the outlier pensions. Um, I think that's... Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just add real quick to what okay. you're saying. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people ask is the buyback, this buyback issue, and that is an issue to us that we looked at as, to me, it's compensation. I think we have number 75%, 80% of our people do the buyback. Some, some number, two-thirds, two okay, 66%. So to me, it's if you make $50,000 and you buy back 5000 and it's 55000 let's just show it as 55000 That's what it is. Um, and it's very transparent. It's very clear. However, then the governor comes out with this proposal saying any buybacks now will not count towards pension comp earnable, so you can't add it to your pension. So then you look at that saying, wow, if we get rid of buybacks and we add it to salary so everybody's equal, now it's just we're guaranteed to pay it. So that's why you have this issue right now of looking at the buyback. Because to me, it's, I just think it's as transparent as possible. If you say you pay somebody $55,000 a year, that's what you pay them. And you don't have to say buyback. And now some people like the idea that they get the up to sell it back. It's like a, their savings account and they buy it. And there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people like to do that. But I think it makes government not look as transparent as it is. But really, it's a, it's a compensation. So we just... That's where some of that struggle was coming with the governor. And I'm not sure the governor is going to get this plan through from what I'm hearing at all. So 
again, it's temporary. We'll look at that. But we got to step. We got to make a step forward. It's been a year. We need to make a step. I know that six months of it, at least, or seven months, was at least just looking and digging information up. And I, a lot of work going on, Matt and Mike, and all the requirements, and you guys did, and Catherine, and all the rest, and Tabine. I know it's a lot of work, but I appreciate the opportunity. And hopefully this was clear enough to give you guys some ideas, but I know we got to come back as ASAP with some other changes to keep this process going down the line. Um, unless you can guarantee me the stock market up 30% a year to make up some of these problems, which I know it's not going to. And Michael, you know, <coughs> I just want to. And if, if I could emphasize mm -hmm. in, in that, that, that this is a step that our, our goal is to have those outliers mm -hmm. that are eroding support for the, for, for the pensions and uh, uh, the, the modest pensions that are out there. We, 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 our goal is to, to not have those outliers and that uh, in the long run, that, that's where we're going. We just realize it's, it, that is complicated to do. We're going to, you know, some of those will still, because of the vesting and everything, some of those still come forward. But that's where we're, that's where we're headed. And that this, I just want to make that clear as we take this first step. I mean, all those tier ones are going to hand tier, back their pensions. Just, yeah, okay. <laughs> I just, uh, I just want to, show, I want to thank uh, Michael, you know, and staff, you know, and, and the board, because we've had a lot of close session. Uh, we've discussed this for hours and hours and hours. So this is really tough for us to. But, you know, the, uh, I strongly support the proposal today because I think that uh, we're going to modify, you know, this item to be for new hires only. And we're also going to limit, you know, the, uh, the uh, number of hours that we can redeem in to one year, which I think is important. And also to prevent the selling of two times within a year that's, that's going to benefit the, the uh, employment compensation, especially in their final year. <clears throat> and also it's going to save the county quite a few dollars in the beginning and ultimately millions of dollars and uh, some nine million dollars and seven percent uh, cut so I just want to thank uh, Michael and, and thank all the uh, employees for their for their opportunity to help us you know with the compensation and also the tax association for for their input so, so what's the pleasure of the board I have no problem making a motion for this piece right now, and uh, we'll be back ASAP to make some other opportunity changes. So. Okay. So that is approved, and we have a time certain at 10:30, which is 10:40. And uh, we have a presentation of resolution proclaiming the month of April 2012 as parliamentary law. And I'd like to have uh, Lourdes or my staff come over and, and help us with that <clears throat> with a proclamation, Lourdes. And then I'll go down and, and, um, and, and uh, hand this out. Who's coming up through this for two reasons? Yes. Um, I'm going to call up Peggy O'Brien and Jerry Olson, who we have the honor of him portraying this morning, General Henry M. Roberts, the author of Roberts' Rule of Order today. And welcome. I'll, I'll be going. He's going to read the resolution. I'll be down to So, good morning, supervisors. Um, I'm going to read the following words. Proclaiming April 2012 as Parliamentary Law Month, whereas it is appropriate to honor Thomas Jefferson, author of the first American Manual of Parliamentary Practice in his birth month, and whereas it is also fitting to honor Henry Martin Robert, author of Pocket Manual of Rules of Order for Deliberative Assemblies, familiarly known as Robert's Rule of Order. And whereas it is important to remember that the correct use of parliamentary procedures prote protects the rights of the majority, the minority, individual members, absentees, and all of these together, all the wire fostering orderly deliberation. And whereas the National Association of Parliamentarians otherwise known as NAP, is a society dedicated to educating leaders throughout the world in effective meeting managements through the use of parliamentary procedures, and whereas the vision of NAP is to provide the parliamentary leadership to Ventura County and the world. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors hereby declares April 2012 as parliamentary 
Law Month in Ventura County and encourages all citizens to observe the month with appropriate program ceremonies and activities presented this 10th day of April 2012. And I want to have General M. General Henry M. Robert recite some couple of words for us. Thank you. Is it Peggy or, or, or? Um, Peggy O'Brien Brown, the president. You want to share a couple of words? Well, yes. first. Or, or the general first. The general who's, first. Most, who's the most important Peggy, person here? Oh, Peggy's my one. <laughs> I would like to uh, thank the Board of Supervisors for the, this proclamation and also that uh, Zeta Chi is a study unit of National Association of Parliamentarians. We meet on the third Monday night of every month except December, and the meetings start at 7 o'clock. They're held at, in the topping room, which is right next door to the E.P. Foster Library on Main Street. So that's in Ventura, third Monday. We'd like to invite anybody who wants to learn more about parliamentary procedure, how to make their meetings run more smoothly and effectively, and uh, we just encourage everyone to attend. And Peggy, how are we doing this morning? Is A or B or C? Don't <laughs> <laughs> ask questions you want answers to. Go ahead, a little long, maybe a B. <laughs> In 1876, General Henry Robert, then a captain in the U.S. Army and an engineer, uh, put together the first copy of Robert's Rules of Order, 136 years ago. 5.5 million copies later, this is the 11th edition, just out in this September. So we're here to say thank you very much. Today, 96% of the organizations in the United States use Robert's Rules of Order as their parliamentary authority. It's a wonderful book, it's an exciting book, and we have a lot of fun with it. Thank you very much. And thank you so much on behalf of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ninety-six percent use it. Thousand Oaks uses Mason rules. Of course. And thank you so much for waiting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supervisor Parks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you're all wondering what today is. <laughs> it's National Bookmobile Day. And um, Supervisor Long and I were uh, both going to be presenting this today. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to attend the meeting today. But we are both strong supporters of bookmobiles. And so I'll just go ahead and, and read that. Whereas libraries across our nation play a vital role in enhancing the quality of life in their local communities, and librarians are the cornerstone of our local libraries, as trained professionals, librarians serve to carry out the mission of the library, which is assisting residents of all ages and backgrounds in finding and interpreting resources necessary to live, learn, and work in an ever-changing society. And whereas for over 100 years, bookmobiles, over 100 years, bookmobiles and direct delivery outreach services have played a vital role in fulfilling the mission of libraries across America. And I can just imagine the horse and carriage That's bookmobile. Mm. <laughs> and within Ventura County, bringing the library's resources and expertise of librarians directly to all types of communities, rural, urban, and suburban. And whereas bookmobiles are modern, ever-changing, and dynamic mobile information centers of the 21st century, providing not only books, but other valuable mediums, including DVDs, music, and resources for job seekers. Additionally, research shows that in communities nationwide, all types of library users are increasingly, increasingly accessing these innovative resources and as an extension of libraries, bookmobiles also serve as part of the American dream, a place for opportunities, education, self-help, and lifelong learning. And supporters across our country are celebrating National Book Day, and in joining them, we recognize the benefits that bookmobiles bring to communities, and therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Supervisors proclaims April 11th as National Bookmobile Day, 
and encourages all residents to take advantage of the wonderful resources, libraries, and bookmobiles that they have to offer. And um, we don't have a bookmobile in Ventura County. So Supervisor have, Long and I, think I are thinking about how we can help <laughs> remedy that situation, both with the help of uh, private sector funding and, and perhaps some matching grants from our um, uh, Ventura County. I, uh, in Thousand Oaks, originally, before we had a library, we had a bookmobile. Essentially, that was the library. And I look at areas in our district, uh, for example, uh, in Somis, in my district, uh, how, what a wonderful resource that would be to have a, a bookmobile come to the elementary school there and really excite learning in children and books. Are so, you know, to, to spark that and encourage book reading, um, I think, and, and not necessarily everything has to be off of the Internet. Books are wonderful, and, and you think about the, the scholastic little forms that you get with your kids when they come home, and you can buy them all these cheap $2 books and two fifty. But to actually get a nice uh, hardback book and, and use the bookmobile, I think, would be wonderful, done with volunteers and also um, private sector funding, and looking forward to bringing forward something that in the near future. So mm. happy Bookmobile Day. Thank you so much. And, uh, Are and, they uh, taken away from the Kindle or what? <laughs> <laughs> Item 26, I have... Uh, Supervisor Bend is going to help me out with the uh, presentation. Oh, excuse me, 20, 25, yeah. The six of salt and awareness thank, one. Th thank you much, very much, uh, Supervisor Zaragoza. And just before I start that, I forgot to hand out my uh, journal memories. Okay. And I wanted to call out that Peter Douglas, who certainly had a huge impact That's with right. Ventura yeah. County, I mean, with the State Coastal Commission. Uh, you, you know, you're talking about somebody that wrote the Coastal Act um, and then ran the commission all that time. Uh, Certainly, it was a nice should recognize his passing provide. away also, yeah. and that's a board of journey memory of uh, him. Thank you, Sir um, Brian. I'd like to call up the executive director, um, Caroline uh, Prigital. 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 Thank you very much, uh, mm -hmm. Set Sutton. Um, and this is a presentation of the Board of Supervisors um, proclaiming April 2012 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Uh, and. Um, uh, we have a lot of resolutions that are going forward, and we have mm -hmm. um, three people up here. I think I'm going to just do a little bit of the resolution and, and let you speak. Uh, but um, sexual assault is an intolerable violent crime with public health implications for every person in the county of Ventura. As a victim or survivor or as a family member, significant other neighbor or co-worker of a victim or survivor. Um, no one person, organization, or agency can eliminate sexual assault on our own. We must work together uh, to address this. Uh, the Coalition for Family Harmony, that we're recognizing here, has led the way in the County of Ventura addressing sexual assault by providing 24-hour hotline services to victims and survivors and their significant others. Um, responding to emergency calls, offering support and comfort to those impacted by sexual assault, and empowering those impacted by sexual assault to chart their own course. Um, and the Coalition uh, for Family Harmony um, is working in, in uh, collaboration, including conversations about what sexual violence is, how to prevent it, <coughs> how to help survivors connect with crucial counseling and other support services. Uh, and the staff and volunteers of sexual assault programs in the County of Ventura work year-round to encourage every person in the county to end sexual violence. And with that, I'd like to uh, ask Caroline to um, make uh, some comments to us as I come down and uh, present this resolution. And any, any, one, of the, any, any one of you, uh, please feel free to address us here in these moments that we have dedicated to this uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Rachel Park. I'm uh, one of the Crisis Response Intervention Co-Coordinators at the Coalition for Family Harmony. Um, and we want to thank you for your recognize, recon, recognition of this um, important Awareness Month. Um, sexual assault is a growing problem in our community. As the only rape crisis center in Ventura County, we have seen a rise in the amount of sexual assault calls that we have responded to. In the past six months alone, we have responded to over 150 victims. Um, that does not account for the estimated 50% of victims who are too afraid or ashamed to come forward. The coalition provides emergency response, advocacy, and accompaniment to victims of sexual assault 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and 365 days a year. Through the Rape Crisis Program, we offer crisis counseling and intervention, needs assessment, emergency shelter, and linkage to appropriate community resources, as well as counseling services for survivors of sexual assault and non-offending caregivers. The coalition also offers a 24-hour bilingual hotline. The Rape Crisis Program staff is comprised of licensed marriage and family therapists, MFT interns and trainees, all of whom are trained specifically to deal with sexual assault. Because victims often feel alone and powerless, the coalition also provides 
group counseling for all survivors of sexual assault to reinforce that no victim is alone in their struggles and that they have the power within themselves to become true survivors. We currently have support groups for women in both English and Spanish and are beginning the county's only male sexual assault group. The coalition also provides education to local organizations, schools, and community members to further spread awareness and understanding of this often taboo subject. It is our belief that before we can create change, we must have awareness of the issue. This is where we have dedicated ourselves to begin the discussion and start the dialogue for all members of our community. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else like to share? I just want to thank you very much for your support um, and awareness of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Uh, every year we have between a 5 and 7 percent increase in the amount of victims that we respond to, and yet funding also has a 5 percent cut every year. So it's important for us to raise awareness that this is uh, – one of a kind in the county, this program, and that our staff is out there every day responding to the needs of these victims, and we thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Okay. That's my prescription. I want to just also thank you for the good work that you do. If someone wants to contact, what, who should they call? Do you have a number that we can have? Um, I think she was just saying. Lourdes, you know, they wanted to share, the supervisor wants to share some. Uh, go ahead, supervisor. I'm saying if, if someone wants to call to get services, what number do they call? Actually, on the back of the card mm -hmm. um, that, I, that is on there, they can call the main office number or they can call the back card, which is our bilingual crisis hotline. Right from the information you gave us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much and appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is um, a presentation that's going to be given by Supervisor Foy in National Public Safety. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate this. And the, the crumb back, I think. Anita, you want to bring your team down? This is National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. And I'll, I'll read this, but as we know, this is a, a critical for all of us. Let me read this real quick before I make some comments. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time, and the prompt response for emergency services is critical to the protection of life and the preservation of property of citizens throughout our nation. And whereas public safety dispatchers are first and most critical contact with citizens who have an emergency services. And that, that is so true. You talk about somebody who all of a sudden calls 911 and they get right. that, 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 is, that is a critical piece. And um, these highly trained professionals are dependent upon to gather the accurate information that is critical in ensuring the safety of our citizens and emergency personnel. And whereas each year the public safety dispatchers and supervisors of Ventura County Sheriff's Office Communicate Center handle almost 350,000 telephone mm -hmm. calls, including 77,000 911 calls, results in almost 100,000 law enforcement responses in 2011. And our public safety dispatchers manage each call with the highest level of service. Whereas in the highly trained public safety dispatchers and supervisors of Ventura County Sheriff's Office Communication Center have contributed substantially to the safety of our citizens, deputies, and deputies by obtaining detailed information, making critical decisions. And I think that's one of the things that people miss, is the decisions that they have to make, exactly. not just taking a call, making a decision where, what, what we're going to do. And quickly dispatch aid in times of emergency, often making the difference between life and death. Whereas the President and Congress of the United States have established the second week of April as National Telecommunications Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Ventura County Board of Supervisors please proclaim that April 8th through 14th, National Public Safety Telecommunications Week expressed the appreciation of all citizens for the diligent service provided to our public safety dispatchers, supervisors, and board commends the professionals for their compassion, understanding, and dedication. Be it uh, further resolved that the Board of Supervisors congratulates Jeremy Kiefer as being uh, selected by his peers and supervisors 2012 Dispatcher of the Year for Ventura County Sheriff's Office. And I want to thank you because, as I mentioned earlier, 911 does work, and it's worked for my family, and I really appreciate what you guys are yeah. doing. It's thousands and thousands of calls and the decisions that you make. It does. And let me let me come down, but I just want to say con, uh, congratulations. See, there's somebody getting this patch right now. Mm. Um, but, it, <laughs> it, it, you know, uh, we have the 
the officers, the firefighters, the ambulances, the paramedics that attend, but it all comes through you to make sure it happens. And I think that's critical, that the money this board is willing Thank to you. invest, make sure it works, but you can invest all the money in the world if you don't have the right professional doing the right work. Exactly. It's not going to happen. So let me come down and present this, make, have some comments. Mm -hmm. CEO Powers and Chairman Zaragoza, some members of the board, um, thank you very much. We appreciate your support, and it's not just on this day and during this week, um, but we feel your support all year long, day in, day out, in terms of providing us with the tools and the resources and the training that we need to do our job so that we can better serve the people of Ventura County. Mm -hmm. um, we have been incredibly blessed over the years to be able to hire some really outstanding people. Um, we have Stephanie Lanford with us, who's one of our prior dispatchers of the year. Um, and Jeremy follows in that tradition. He was selected unanimously by his peers, and they made comments um, that were really over the top, and, and they're very well deserved about his compassion, his skill, his knowledge, um, his willingness to help people, his cooperativeness as a team member. And he really is just one of those people that is all around what we're looking for when we look for public safety communications professionals. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Sheriff Dean and Assistant Sheriff Pentis, and especially Assistant Sheriff Crombach. Um, especially then? Especially. It's very supportive. Um, but I would, I'd like to thank them for their support. Um, they really they give us you know, what we need to do the best job possible. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jeremy. Okay, I Jeremy. just want to say thank you. Um, it is very important to me and to my colleagues. You know, we do the best that we can day in and day out. And I wouldn't be able to do it without them. It's the people not only I work with in our agency, but the agencies that neighbor us that make it worth the while. And it's our teamwork and with them that makes it possible. So thank you. I just want to thank you so much for what you do. It, the job is so pivotal to everything, and it's, a, I know, also a very stressful job, and you have to absolutely, you know, keep your composure and, and not the, the easiest thing to do. And I just really uh, laud you and, and the people who do dispatch, particularly for our county and for the citizens of our county, just really appreciate the good works that you do, you, saving I, lives. Supervisor, I think that maybe we ought to take a photo with it. I'd like to take a vote. Yeah. One thing I will say that um, congratulations on doing it because your peers have to see somebody special to do it. And I appreciate that. And so thank you. Congratulations. And Nita, thank you for running a great department here, no matter what your husband says. You are, you are the smart one of the family. <laughs> Okay, uh, our next item is uh, item 27, um, our market value investment report. This is it, investment, investment report. Okay. We used to call him the million dollar man. The million dollar now, man. Now we're just the hundred thousand dollar man. <laughs> <laughs> the billion dollar man. Well, we know what he does, but how much are you giving us? <laughs> Thank you very much. Bob Hansen, Chief Investment Officer. Um, today is April 10th, the second Christmas payment 
that we get. Uh, the okay, last day to pay your taxes without a fine. We're open till five o'clock. Uh, we'll accept uh, anything by mail, postmark the tenth or earlier. And we <laughs> you get your check. <laughs> I'll, I'll be glad to take it. Um, and we have a, we have a drop box out in front uh, of the hall of administration that will be open until midnight to accept payments for people that are late. And we'll be happy to take payments tomorrow also, but that would cause you a 10% penalty. Well, it looks like finally we might have an increase in interest rates um, a year from now, which is good because last time I was here, they were forecasting several years for an increase in rates. And they anticipate the second quarter of 13 seeing the Fed possibly raise rates. And that would mean prior to that, the market will raise rates because the Fed will be the last one to come to the party as far as raising rates. And of course, someone's ox is always getting gored, but for the portfolio, we would like to see some rates uh, increase from where they are, at least moderately, and, and not to disturb the economy. Uh, one update. Uh, regarding our portfolio. General Electric had a downgrade uh, of the company, GE Company, to uh, AA3 in their corporate bonds, and GE Capital Corp was downgraded to A1. Uh, I'm sure that you've noticed that just about everybody, including the U.S. government, uh, has been downgraded. Quick comments on this situation doesn't really concern me. Um, when you think that GE Company in 2011, and GE Company is the one that makes light bulbs and power plants and washing machines and dryers, the durable goods, they made 100 billion in revenue in 2011. GE Company, GE Capital Corp. The finance and uh, arm of the uh, company in their subsidiary, they do commercial and consumer lending. They made $46 billion in revenue. So also I thought it was very interesting that when Moody's gave the rating, they said regarding GE, the parent company, GE, we believe that GE's industrial operations continue to have many AAA-like credit characteristics. Regarding GE Capital Corp., the finance arm, Moody's continues to view GECC as one of the strongest finance companies in the world. So if they say that, why are they downgrading? After 2008, they got completely blindsided. So many companies went out of business that were incorrectly rated. Now they're reviewing and, in most cases, lowering everyone's rating. This is still an excellent company, and at this point, uh, there really isn't much concern. Our commercial paper rating, which is A1 plus P1, was unchanged. And the longest maturity that I own in, uh, that we own in General Electric Company and Capital Corp is only 386 days. Uh, and we own a total of 57 million. As far as the liquidity of the corporate bond market, I've been asked that many times. Uh, excellent. It's four trillion in size and three billion a day in volume. So getting in and out of bonds is not a problem. It's a highly liquid market. But I did want you to uh, be advised of that uh, at this point, uh, I still see it as a top flight investment, and I don't see anybody that's not being downgraded, like I said, even the U.S. government. Hmm. And we have to buy something. Same thing with the federal agencies. Fannie Mae and Mortgage Corp. went under conservatorship in 2008. It runs out in 2012. Well, they did it once. They're certainly going to extend it again. Hopefully, they'll merge those two agencies because really there shouldn't be two. The Fannie Mae came out in the 30s. Mortgage Corp came out in the 70s. 
I really don't understand why they didn't make it uh, one company. The other thing to keep in mind if you have uh, concerns about Fannie Mae and Mortgage Corp, consider this, that the entire banking system is about $12 trillion, and Fannie Mae and Mortgage Corp are almost $6 trillion. So they're half the size of our whole banking system. They are, without them, we would not have mortgages. So really, the system has to keep them in business. So Congress will bail them out at the end of 2012, if at that point it's necessary. So uh, I have absolutely no concern. The catastrophic effect of them going out of business would be, for example, LA County owns, let's take Fannie Mae, three and a half billion. Orange County, 1.2 billion. You know our position, which is on the chart. So it's, it's really almost impossible for them to go out of business without shaking our whole financial system. But they're in the news because of their accounting methods and their profits. And they really need to get better organized <clears throat> and uh, just get their act together, like Home Loan has and the Federal Farm Credit Bank. I really don't have any other comments. I'm available for questions. Any questions? Well, in our long running, you know, efforts to just keep, mm -hmm. you know, trying to stay a step ahead of the game, I, I. Uh, I, I appreciate what you're saying about the about Fannie Mae and, and, and Freddie and uh, you know their size and Congress has to rescue them, et cetera. And at the same time, I think we've all learned that you have to expect the unexpected or the thing that seems un, un uh, you know. And I'm not saying we change anything. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that we just we just keep our antenna up there and 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 watch because. Um, in spite of how big they are, the, I think in 2005, most people would have said, no, some, some of the things that happened in 2008 could not have happened or 2007. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the comments. I appreciate the, um, the research and, and you getting back to us, because I know we've raised some of those concerns and you're getting back to us. I feel, I feel better hearing what you have to say. So thank you very much, and we'll all just keep our eyes open here. Thank I can you. tell you I'm concerned all the time. Right. Yeah. I, but now I can't watch the news and find something good. Even the U.S. government was sure, downgraded. Right. Exactly. But when the news came out about GE, I even took a sleeping bag for one night and slept next to my washer and dryer to see if I could get any vibrations. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I couldn't. But I'm really, I'm really into it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hanley. I worry about everything. But I want to tell you, as far as the board and the CEO, I appreciate very much the questions because I believe in that old trust but verify so I enjoy all of your questions thank you thank you so much and the real estate market is doing, We're doing better good. slowly a little bit of time a little bit <laughs> pardon me <laughs> well, thank you so much so um, just let's not receive a file it's just a, a report Okay. Now, 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 now be nice to him. He's one of our voting members. Yeah, that's right. We can get some things changed. Let's go ahead and vote on that. <laughs> we have uh, to the uh, APCD board. You know, we have one more item, and we're running a little late. Is that uh, that okay? Thank you so much. I, I, item twenty-eight. We're probably about ten fifty. About ten fifteen minutes. If you want to get a drink of water or something. Thank you. Well, we got our new fire chief here. Congratulations again, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Mr. Powers, I'm here today to uh, speak about the acquisition of real property in Upper, Ho uh, Upper Ojai. This is for relocation of the current fire station 20. I know we have a number of speakers here today, so I will be uh, brief but very succinct and give you just a, a bit of history because uh, it will be necessary as these members of the, the community come up here and, and speak. 
Uh, the station up there was built in 1959. It's 52, going on 53 years old. It's probably our smallest fire station in our entire fleet. It's outdated, uh, does not meet uh, current building codes. And beyond that, we have a number of issues related to it. Uh, one, of, one of the most prominent is uh, we have methane seepage up there in that area. Uh, we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on monitoring and containment issues there. And we have some issues with traffic. It's located right on a blind curve. And the current lot size is just not uh, acceptable for reconstructing the, the current fire station. As we all know, our fire stations in, in many of our communities are the single point of government and, in that case, very important. Uh, very quickly, as far as our process, we've been looking for a replacement property for a number of years. A uh, little over a year ago, we identified a suitable site, what we thought was a suitable site. Our parameters, just so you know, is uh, a minimum of one acre. Uh, for up there, for response time issues, we need to, needed to ensure that the fire station was uh, going to be located between its current site and Sulphur Mountain Road to the west. That's probably about a, a half-mile envelope. Pushing it on either side of that envelope would impact uh, response times into either the east or west end of the community. Uh, as I had said, we had identified a parcel, uh, had a community meeting up there in March of 2011, and the community came and spoke and we listened. And really what they said was the, the parcel that we had identified uh, back over a year ago, that it was in an area that was too densely populated. They were concerned about noise and traffic issues as well as lighting issues. And really, uh, the majority of the folks that came and spoke said that was not acceptable. They made recommendations that we consider a parcel, uh, finding a parcel further to the west and on the south side of Santa Paula Ojai Road. And so we abandoned the, the parcel that we had identified after the community meeting. We spent the last year searching for a parcel. We've sent out letters to a number of uh, residents up there and property owners that had parcels that had the potential to be suitable for a fire station location. Uh, to no avail, uh, we had no responses from those property owners. Uh, Public Works Real Estate Services actually went out, reached out to a large parcel owner up there and identified, we had identified a suitable location. The property owners were interested in at least beginning discussions. We began discussions with them and decided that it would be feasible for us to carve out a two-acre piece of uh, property up there. Once we had identified that, again, we, we reached out to the community. We sent out letters to over 99 of the residences up there, those within a half-mile radius of the proposed site, again, inviting them to the fire station up there for community input. Uh, what we found this time was uh, much uh, they were much more open to the, the current location. Now, that's not to say that it, there was unanimous support, uh, but there was support. Uh, we had listened to them and found a location that was in a much more acceptable area. Now, there were still concerns, and there's concerns related to the size of the, pro uh, the, size of the fire station, light, and, again, noise issues. As you know, that community up there uh, is very quiet, uh, bucolic, rural community, and we are committed to making sure that the community meet, uh, uh, remains that way. Uh, so with that, uh, we have... Uh, assured the community members up there that with the design of a new fire station there will be ample opportunity for community input in the design and that we will address all of their issues related to noise and light, light pollution uh, potential issues. And uh, we will hold community meetings up there just for that specific purpose. With that, I would uh, like to allow the community members to come up here for public comment and I will stay and comment um, after their death. Thank you, Chief. I have uh, four uh, speaker cards, and uh, I'm going to limit that to three minutes each. And the first one is uh, Doug Colburn, followed by Philip Walker. Doug Colburn. Greetings. Um, as you can see, I put on my best attire for this uh, mm -hmm. uh, venue. <laughs> my name is Doug Colburn. Uh, my wife and I purchased the property immediately east of the proposed site in uh, the year 2000. Um, and initially, uh, I was ambivalent about this uh, proposed site and new building. However, having spent a little more time um, thinking about it and getting answers to some of the questions, I've now uh, jumped off the fence and I am opposed 
at this time to the uh, pro to the uh, proposed development. My primary concerns are one uh, personal. As I look out my back window, I have an unobstructed view to the west with uh, beautiful sunsets and um, undeveloped land. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I looked out my uh, kitchen window and there was a soils testing truck point blank right in between the trees. Um, my jacuzzi and my pool are also uh, set up in a uh, position conducive to enjoying that uh, unobstructed view to the west. So I have personal reasons. Um, I've been told that it's going to be a single story building, which is going to minimize the, uh, the view. A uh, single story fire station is not a 12 foot residence, okay, a single story fire station in my experience has to house an engine. It's considerably taller than your typical single story building. All right, so there I am with a, with a concern again with the, of aesthetics. Uh, the light at night, one of our, my family's favorite things to do is to sit out in the jacuzzi, like I said, and enjoy the stars moon, whatever, natural lighting. Uh, I know that they're going to do everything they can to minimize the effect of uh, uh, any kind of light pollution. Nevertheless, it's going to be there. Um, the other, uh, so our, our residence is approximately 200 feet uh, east of the proposed site. Uh, every time the engines back up, I think uh, it's some sort of law that they have to have the beeping sounds, right? Is, are we going to have a uh, deal with this beeping in the middle of the night whenever we go out on a call? Is there going to be a design that, that's going to address this issue, maybe a roundabout type in and out um, where we store the engines? Okay, well, ultimately, we're no longer going to have an unobstructed view to the east. The other uh, issue that I have is... Um, whether or not there's actually a need for um, this proposed uh, building. And darn it, I wish I'd have been paying attention more because this is my primary issue. Can I request a few more minutes? Doug, can you conclude? Yeah. All right. Um, uh, in this day and age, uh, economic factors considered, is this the best time to build a new building, spend this kind of money? Personally, I'm not so sure, and I'm not so sure that the taxpayers would would uh, support this in general. Um, there's going to be a cost of demolition, um, as well as the cost of the new building, uh, the methane gas. Is there any documented uh, health issues with regard to uh, this methane gas seepage? There's two residences on either side of the existing building. I, I'm not aware of any any health issues. Um, the corner is an issue. It's the uh, proximity of the corner or the fire existing station to the road. Uh, safety issues, cars coming up the road, I think that could be addressed easily with the flashing light anytime that uh, the engine's been summoned. Um, the oil trucks are frequently coming out the opposite side. There, as far as I know, we've never had an issue with an accident Doug, there. Doug, thank you. The chief yeah. is right behind you, so he can probably... Okay. Uh, All right. Ultimately, I'll, I'll conclude by, by asking... Um, um, I, I want everyone, uh, especially the residents of Upper Ojai, in support of this site to consider the, the strong sense of community uh, within Upper Ojai and, and ask yourself if, if this new site is actually necessary and uh, the impact it will have on the, the immediate neighbors here, me thank being one of them. Thank you so much. Um, Philip Walker would be the next person. Thank you so much. Will, if, you, if I may, okay. will, does the existing site compromise the ability of the, the firefighters to do their job efficiently as it stands now? That's, that's ultimately what I want to close with. And thank you for your time. Supervisor uh, Fair Bennett. question. Thank you. Uh, Walker, Philip Walker, followed by Paul Devine, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And the last one is going to be Joe Davey. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I just uh, here in support of the station. I think the fire department's done a tremendous job of uh, trying to 
to settle this uh, problem. It sounds complicated, but I think the need for the station is, is paramount. We're an isolated community. Uh, we need their service. Uh, I personally, right now, I represent eight of my neighbors who are in favor of it. One of them, Tony De Maria, who lives directly across from it, is in favor of it and uh, wishes to see the station built. So that being said, I know there's a lot of comp compromises that have to be made, but I believe the station being built there is one of the best right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Walker. And we have Paul, D-E-N-E-E-N. -E -E and the last one is Joe Davey. Uh, thank you. My name is Paul Deneen. Thank you for the opportunity mm -hmm. to speak. I own property immediately adjacent to the proposed site. Uh, I say that by way of disclaimer, and if it was up to me alone, I would prefer not to be looking at a 6,000 square foot building where there is currently open space. But as a resident of the Upper Ohio and a taxpayer, I have two concerns. I'm not sure exactly when, but it was sometime prior to when my family moved up there in 89. The county, in its wisdom, had created the open space zoning that uh, currently is in effect up there, and I believe it's 40-acre minimum lot size <clears throat> on the parcel where they've uh, agreed to separate the two acres. It's considered an important area of policy in this county, I believe. I know that it's extremely difficult for private individuals to get zoning variances or to do any sort of development in open space. And I understand there must be some sort of exemption for uh, fire departments and so on. But I would hope that in order to exercise that exemption, they have very good reason and they have exhausted uh, any possible sites that don't require cutting into open space. Uh, currently, they're in the community of Summit where there are other public buildings. It's a school, it's a restaurant, there's another business, there's an Edison facility. Uh, that's the logical place. Uh, I'm personally not convinced. I attended the second of the two meetings and did not hear compelling arguments that that site was, uh, couldn't be uh, corrected in, in some way. Uh, my second concern is the cost. Uh, the, the figure was something in excess of $3 million. Uh, they were talking about nearly tripling the size of the station. And this is at a time when there's very little development going on in the Upper Ohio. They're not planning to add equipment, as I understand it. It just seems like it's, uh, it's excessive at a time when uh, public services and government is being cut back in many other areas. <coughs> Uh, so I, I would just urge uh, the board and, and my fellow residents to just take a close look at whether it's really necessary and whether that's uh, whether there's not some site that's not in open space that could be developed. But thank you. Thank you for your input. And so let me ask: were, but, was, he, was he against sir? it, sir? Were you against it or for? Or are you just asking people to take a closer look? I, I, I'm sorry. I. I am personally against it. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Joe Davey. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Davey, Joe Davey, and uh, my family has been there since uh, 89 as well, but uh, it was 1889. And uh, we have a lot of history uh, in the Upper Ohio. I live uh, with my children and my wife about a half a mile from the proposed site, west of the proposed site. So I'm speaking right now for the next four minutes, in the, or next two minutes, uh, on my time, not on the state time, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, the two things that people have talked about, the money issues, I'm going to leave that completely to you. I'm sure the county has budgeted for the new department. I think from an upper OI perspective, uh, it's an excellent opportunity. Uh, it has to happen eventually. That station, I believe, I'm sure the chief will discuss it, but I think it was in the late 50s, maybe 1960. Uh, I've been there uh, next week. It will be 52 years that I've lived in the Upper Ohio. I think it's time that we replace the station. Uh, the, the constant uh, seepage of the methane, although I'm sure they have it under control, and it's an issue for everybody in the Upper Ohio because it's a, it's, a, it's a natural gas and an oil area, 
Um, I think it's time that we, we remove the firefighters from there specifically. The new place they're talking about has excellent view both to the left, both to the west, and to the east. It's an excellent opportunity for the county right now to buy a piece of property at fairly low values. The, the property up there, the property values have gone down recently. I think it's a perfect opportunity to replace the existing station, make it bigger, move it into the 21st century, and, uh, and help all the upper Ojai Valley residents out. I think you're just, you know, there are a lot more people uh, who couldn't be here today who would be in favor of that they have, had the opportunity to, to address each one of you. But, but the issue is specifically, uh, do you have the money? I think the county has the money. I think under the leadership of the previous administration and the new administration of the fire department, the monies have been budgeted. This seems to be an excellent opportunity. For public safety, you have to have a station up in the upper Ojai. Uh, at the last meeting, we talked about very briefly moving it to farther to the east. That makes no sense at all. The chief will address that, I'm sure. Moving it farther to the west, uh, I, it doesn't make any sense. It drops out all the Santa Paula folks and all the people up in the upper Ojai. So this is a perfect opportunity. It's a perfect space. I appreciate my neighbor's concerns. It's not directly in my backyard. It is a half mile away, and I understand their concerns. But uh, from a from a longtime resident and from, uh, from a public safety perspective, my own perspective, I think it's the perfect opportunity. Thank you. So, Thank you. So let me just, just, just question again. Mm -hmm. I understand the personal side. So you're saying from a public safety, as a public safety professional, you see it as a needed piece and it's good, a good location, anything else? Absolutely. And the biggest thing from a traffic safety perspective, the issue is site visibility from both directions. Where they are now, regardless of whether you put a traffic light out there or not, because we have people kill the traffic lights all the time, it's, it's, a, it's not a good spot. It's a much better area where they're going to be. The engines have gotten bigger since 1960. So, that, I mean, that's a fire department issue. But from, from my perspective, right, right where I live, uh, there have been eight fatalities at that corner in the last 50 years that I'm aware of, and probably more before that. So if you move it farther west, you decrease your sight distance. So right where it is uh, is a great spot. And I a think safety from, issue, then. from a safety issue, from the safety perspective of visibility mm -hmm. and accessibility. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate thank it. you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm sure you know the chief. You know, this yes, is chair. a district, and it's, it's an enterprise fund. It's been budgeted, and, and, and it's not general fund monies, and you have the dollars you know, for it. Right. We, we have more than adequate reserves, and, in fact, it came to you last month in the, the C, CIP board letter uh, that you approved. Uh, to begin with, just very quickly so I can uh, address some of the issues that came up from the community members there, we know as we're addressing public policy that there's rarely ever a, a perfect uh, solution to a problem. Uh, for us, the, the, the best solution would have been to uh, rebuild on, its, on the uh, current fire station site. Obviously, the community's uh, accustomed to it there, and that would have been optimal, and we fully explored that. The issues with the, actually the size and the um, specs of the parcel, it's a very narrow parcel there. It just cannot accommodate a modern, a modern fire station, as well as the issues related to methane and the traffic issues that we discussed. Uh, one of the residents asked us about the beeping. Uh, w the way we design fire stations now is they have pull-throughs, so it's very, very infrequent that we ever need to back up the fire, uh, the fire engines at the stations now. It will have a pull-around, and, and the engine will actually pull straight through the fire station. And we also talked about actually figuring out a way, if, if in the off chance that we need to have it backing up, that we might be able to disable that device on there. So that was one of the things. Uh, the, the financial aspects we've already addressed and the view shed. And we, the fire district, we recognize that uh, regardless of where we put the fire station, it is in all likelihood going to be in somebody's uh, line of sight. And so we are committed to that. We recognize that. And we are committed to, uh, however we can, at least mitig mitigating and minimizing the impact that it has on people's view shed, whether that's with station design. As I said, we'll have community input. Also, our landscape design. Uh, we'll be looking and meeting with the residents and talking about planting mature trees so we can at least shade whatever they might end up seeing as far as the fire station goes. But it will be a process that involves uh, significant community input. So and it will also be our most moderately sized modern fire station that we've built.
Okay. Questions? Sure. Supervisor Zaragoza, if, if, if I could, um, mm -hmm. representing um, residents of Upper Ojai, I, 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 you've, you've asked, you asked some fair questions, you know. Can the existing site be used? Is this the, is this the best use of money? Uh, certainly when times are tight, et cetera. Uh, this has been on our radar screen for a significant period of time. We've been briefed. I've asked lots of questions about, I've asked those very questions, and I just have to, uh, my response to you is, um, yes, I think as, as the, the new chief is, is pointing out to us, we've budgeted for this, we've planned for this. Um, it is the, it is the, um, it is a, a, an appropriate use of our funds at this point in time. And the other thing that, that I would offer to you is that um, the existing site, because you know, from from a local elected official standpoint, the existing site is always the best site. You know, you're, you're already there, but it just it, it does not work. Um, and uh, and I would offer to you it. it, it to meet the current standards. And when, when we're sitting here today thinking about making this decision, it, it reminds me a little bit, I taught at Nordoff High School for, for 20 years. The superintendent of, that, that built Nordoff High School uh, was really proud that he brought it in as the uh, least expensive per square foot school in California in the 1950s. It was also the worst built school in California in the 1950s. <laughs> and, and in the 1990s, people were still, we, we had rooms as hot as it is in Ojai with no cross ventilation at all. I mean, just in, in, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of design. Um, and um, so we have to think all the way down the road. The existing site just will not allow us to build a station that will be the kind of station we need 15 years from now and 20 years from now and 30 years from now. I would offer to you that the residents of Upper Ojai deserve uh, to have this modernization. Um, in, in, including the neighbors that are there. And, and there is no place, as the Chief pointed out, no place that somebody won't have some kind of impact. Um, so the one thing I'm going to add to my motion is just a direction to the, to the fire department to make sure that they have appropriate community meetings to get input on design, and I know the Chief has already committed to that. Um, and uh, it's the, the residents deserve that, and the firefighters up there, uh, this location is going to be safer for the firefighters that work at that station also. Um, and um, so with that, um, I would um, like to make the motion to, uh, for us to go forward with uh, mm -hmm. with this. Uh, with all due respect, that Upper Ojai is a you talk about a special place in Ventura County. That is a special place, um, but there is there is a reason why there is an exception um, in our in our. Uh, um, ordinances and laws for things like fire stations because you have to constantly weigh the public's um, need for uh, this emergency service relative to to the other uh, the other things that we're trying to do and, and uh, I don't hope I, I expect and I'm sure it will happen that the fire department will make sure that the quality of life in the Upper Ojai is is um, is, is is not. Uh, significantly impacted by um, the construction of this new fire station. And in fact, everybody is, is, is going to be better off, right? You know? um, Thank you, Chief. Um, what's, the 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 what's the pleasure of the board? Uh, sh sure. I mean, but, but one, very, one, very quickly, we have, a, we have an air pollution control meeting. Yes, come, come on up come here to here. the mic. Right. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've all seen the site map, but um, there are that particular uh, plot of land was is a small portion of some 1,500 acres. If it could only be um, reconsidered, like the exact location, just a bit further from our homes, I'd be in all, fully supportive of it. Um, so I ask for Great. a slight you, delay in making this decision. That's all. You, you got it on the record. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And who, who knows? I mean, that's be that's that's a piece of input that. Uh, Thank yeah. you very much. Great. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to make the motion to um, move forward with the recommended action at this point in time. Chief, some things just aren't fun, are they? <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, there's a second. all I would say is that he, you know, everybody, somebody gets yeah. affected by some of this sure. stuff, and it's hard to right. say. Well, Hopefully, and, as and he gets to spend the nights out there with his family, the, the lighting will be as less as possible. I'm sure you'll do that. And, and I think one of the important will. things. And if you do find something that is, you know, in terms of location or whatever, uh, please, you know. Bring that forward. Obviously, we're always looking for that. Absolutely. Right. And Chief, the important thing, and as mentioned to all the speakers, safety is a really the paramount uh, issue here. Okay. Let's vote. We have one more item, real quick, in this correspondence. Thirty-seven. Move to receive and file. Okay. 
the first and the second. I want to thank the community. Good testimony thank today. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I'd also like to share that we're going to be going into closed session at 1 o'clock for the Board of Supervisors. Are we going to – Leroy? Leroy, are we going to have any announcements? I don't have a screen to vote if you're waiting for me. After – we're going to have closed session at 1 o'clock. We might have a, um, an announcement. And now we go APCD. So okay. hard. We, oh, it was first and second. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. I didn't say that. To make an announcement uh, from Leroy and the board. Yes, uh, we have one announcement on item 34, Central Delta Water Agency versus Watershed Protection District. Sacramento Superior Court, case number 34, 2010, 8000561. The board authorized the director of watershed to Consent to joint representation of Watershed Protection District and Kern Water Bank Authority by the law firm of Best, Best, and Krieger. And the vote was three yes, zero no, and one abstention. Linda Parks abstained. Yeah. Kathy Long was absent. Yeah, absent. That's okay. It. okay, thank you. So we're going back to closed session, and we're going to adjourn from closed session with no additional announcements. Correct. Thank you.